What's up? How's it going, guys? Hey, doing hey. Good. good. Yeah, sweet. It's happy to be here. This is Jesse Jacoby after all this time. I know. We've been <laughs> internet friends for years now. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, brothers it in two mold, right? Yeah, brothers in two mold. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, like, yeah. like it, it. It seems uh, it's so cool to see like you two, especially being uh, traditional painters, having like themes and 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 approaches that totally work for two mold, but wildly different styles. Uh, yeah, but it melded really well, didn't it? I mean, totally. I had people ask me if I had done his latest cover, and I said no. Yeah. Funny. <laughs> they, they thought it might be me, oh, which I was very, very, very flattered by because I'm just knocked out by his latest cover. Like yeah. That one and the and the one for the Lovecraft the festival. Uh, oh, album, okay. Um, yeah, it was a there was Gary Records. Am I right? Yeah. 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 Or uh, Cadaver Records. Oh, is that it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Man, yeah. what a knockout piece! I still haven't found one in the wild yet. I'm gonna have to break down and. Ah man, well, uh, if you if you really want, I have an extra one here, and I could send it to you. Oh, I I, I will shoot. Well, I'll tell you what, we we'll will we'll privately discuss this, and I'll shoot you some hard cash bucks. I'd be happy to. It's just oh. sitting in my closet, so I don't even have a record player right now. I'm an imposter. So. <laughs> I don't either. I have these <laughs> my girlfriends. Yeah, still like that. Still like that. <laughs> she charges me <laughs> one dollar per play. <laughs> So this will probably come out in like March or April, but it's like okay. towards the end of February now. Um, I guess like uh, just kind of going around the room. Like, what's new with you, James? What's been going on? Um, it's it's basically uh, it's the start of the year, so it's basically waiting for things to drop. Um, been busy. Like fourth quarter is always my busiest. Uh, so coming into the new year is finishing up all the crazy busy work and then just waiting inevitably for <laughs> things to slowly uh, start being revealed. Um, so the biggest thing recently is uh, a couple weeks ago, I, I revealed that I got to do gatefold art for Carrie King is wild full circle type shit. where like, you know, I, I remember being a kid going to see him play a local guitar store uh, doing a demonstration and Last year, got to the the label reached out and got to hang with them and talk doing some album art, and that's just been sick to finally uh, reveal. Um, it's mainly been that. Uh, also, got recently uh, covers for uh, Heavy Temple and Morgul Blade. Both are uh, so very it's been good. Like, heavy. Thank Temple, you. Yeah. yeah, the Heavy Temple man, I, I love that one in particular. The yeah. Morgul Blade's sick too. It's, oh, the Heavy Temple one, yeah, sorry. I was I was like, which one is that? And then I remember seeing it when you posted it, and I was like, holy shit, what is that? So, yeah, yeah. I've, sat, I've sat and had beers with Heavy Temple singer Sue Denham, you know, and uh, she's a blast. <laughs> well, um, are, are you also, like, based in Philly? Like No, uh, uh, but I go out there a lot because I've done a lot of the Stoner Doom, you know, the, the East Coast Maryland Doom scene. I've, I've, I know a lot of those guys, and I've done a lot of the album covers and t-shirt work for those guys out there. Just, it just happened. So I go, go out there a lot. And usually when they do the Maryland doom festival, not the last couple of years, but usually I have a booth set up and sell artwork and sell prints and things like that, you know, and then, and, and, and hand out business cards. And believe me, the, the schmooze factor can't be, you know, you can't understate overstated or understated enough. It's just, you, it's a, the mo one of the most necessary things. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like it, it's part of why, like I'm, I'm just itching for, um, psycho las vegas to happen again yeah. this year because it just brings in so many bands uh, from all over the place that usually would skip right over vegas um i mean the last time they did it we had emperor here like that's probably the last time emperor's ever gonna be in vegas <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> so yeah no it's um it's it's been a whole lot of album covers i've also in the meantime been doing uh more uh magic the gathering art so oh, we yes. finally start uh, sharing that. Uh, that started in 2022 and is just now getting revealed. So it goes to show that sometimes the stuff you do, you might just be sitting on it for a while. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. It, it really just depends on the client when they're ready to show it. Um, so, no, things have been busy. It's It's been nice. Uh, I'm glad that this has been able to to work out uh, the past couple of years. So uh, I'm I'm busy, doing good. 
Nice, man. You know, something that I think is super cool that uh, I saw you post on Instagram because I'm a I'm a huge fan of the channel, but you, you met the hard lore guys. You met Bo oh, yeah. and Colin. Like, dude, that's so awesome. Like, I watch that good. show every Thursday. Love those dudes. Love that channel. They, they are exactly in real life <laughs> the way they are on the podcast. Yeah, I they bet. They are just two, uh, uh, two d- delightful boys. Uh, also, I just feel so small around them <laughs> yeah they, they are they are good eating strong boys <laughs> and I, I just feel so tiny uh next to them uh but yeah it was cool meeting up with them in vegas and I, i've done a couple designs for them a couple designs for uh collins projects uh so it's always nice when a client comes down to vegas you're able to just go to dinner hang out with them very cool and, and apparently their AG1 ads work for you, huh? I think oh, I, yeah. they mentioned you in one of these yeah, latest episodes. I mean, I mean have, have you been on it too? Yeah, I do Primal Greens because it's cheaper, but yeah, it helps yeah. for sure. Yeah, no, nah, I, I just, for me, getting uh, vitamins every day uh, because all I do is sit all day and look at a screen. I need something to help me out. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you, AG1. <laughs> Not sponsored, by the way. Not but sponsored. If you're yeah. You can email me. <laughs> What about you, Jesse? What's up? Um, I think I spoke to you at the end of October, and honestly, art-wise, like very little has happened since then. Um, the uh, I did a t-shirt design for two mold for these two New York shows that they were playing this past weekend. Oh, yeah, I'm sure by the time this comes out, it'll have been far in the past. But um, that was. A small thing I did, and uh, since then, since like early December, I've been working on this one album cover that I can't talk about yet, and um, uh, it's just dragging on and on, and it's making me insane, and <laughs> I'm like so over it, to be honest. But um, oh, I think we all know that feeling. Jesus. Yeah. Christ, man! I it, it hasn't been like this in probably a couple of years, but uh, <laughs> well, don't look at it, man. Turn, turn it around. <laughs> yeah. so is it a, is it a case of like there's there's been a lot of edits? Uh, part of it for sure. Um, yeah, because because sometimes it's that, and sometimes it's just like you're wrestling with the piece, can't quite figure it out. You it's know? mostly like, that. It's mostly yeah. That. And and I and I don't even know why. Um, it's just sometimes it happens. And yeah, they sometimes they fly out of you, and other times you're like uh, just battling with this thing for months, and you know, starting to think about like, should I even be painting anymore? Like, what am I doing? But uh, like, I'll get past that. I mean, it's part of the yeah. process sometimes. Uh, yeah, it's it's not. You're not a real artist until you've had a, a existential crisis at some point during I, a piece. Only yeah. ten of them. Yeah. yeah, that's that's where I've been for the last uh, few weeks anyway. But I'm I'm starting finally to like feel like I'm able to wrangle this thing. So another couple of weeks on that, and that's that'll be good. Um, I did another album cover a few months ago that is also not released. So hopefully both of these things will come out this year, and then I can you know show them off. But uh, other than that. Um, you know, I come, I'm only kind of like half joking when I say that I'm thinking about quitting painting because like I'm, I'm definitely not. But what this uh, commission is kind of making me feel is that I need to um, maybe kind of retreat this year and do some of my own stuff. Um, yeah. Because I really kind of haven't in the last two years or so. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've done like a couple like, in between commissions or whatever, I'll do like a little 10 by 10 painting or like, you know, something like that just to like make me feel like I still have my own ideas. But um, it's, yeah, with this commission, I'm like, once I finish this, I think it's going to be a load off for me to kind of look inward again and maybe kind of figure out what I want to do next with my own work. So, um, we'll see how the rest of this year goes, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. 
So. It's kind of like a, a reset. And then um, if you are going to like depart and try different styles, when you do emerge and you show that work, which you control when you show it, which is yeah. a pleasure, yes. it can be uh, somewhat of a promotion for, hey, I'll do more of this type of work. So it, yeah. it'll feel fresh for you. Yeah, that's the other thing, too, is that, like, um, you know, I definitely plan on working for bands in the future. I mean, probably even later this year, I'll do a thing or two, you know. But um, if you go too long, I think, without doing anything substantial for yourself, then you kind of lose sight of the whole thing. Maybe it's just me. But, um, yeah, it's like I, I need to f I feel like I can come up with – newer and better skills and approaches to you know then maybe offer to people like i'm feeling like i kind of just need to level up in general i guess so uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it though as draining as this commission has been um i do feel pretty jazzed about the next few months and what i might be able to get into so sick man yeah, well, until you've got blood running from your eyes, you just have to. <laughs> It'll be gone soon. I, I, will, I will finish this painting. <laughs> no, I, I, you, I think that's that's necessary for everybody. Need yeah, a little oh, break. Yeah, yeah start on your own stuff. If you can afford to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got a, I got a day job for that reason, you know. So oh, there you go. Like it kind of it sucks on the one hand because um, you know obviously I'd rather be home painting all the time, but on the other hand, it's like well. And yeah, in, in these moments when I do need to step back, at least, uh, you know, my bills are paid. So, yeah, it's all good. But yeah, Brad, uh, I'm sure you're working on a lot of stuff. Whenever we uh, message and stuff, it's like, hey, what's new with Brad? It's like six things, man. How are you juggling everything? Uh, yeah, well, you know, and juggling is the best way to put it. Um, I'm finishing up a wraparound cover right now for a band called Obscene which mm -hmm. um, have Sick. a small following, but their following is rabid. So I'm very, actually feel very fortunate. They picked me for this on nameless grave records, but then my next commissions coming up all the way till summer don't have anything to do with metal. I work for two book cover book companies, book publishing companies in Oregon, and I'll be doing some horror paperback and hardcover book and interior illustration stuff, all painted. They did talk about having one of the projects be comic book style ink, and then colored in or maybe just left in ink that's still in the air we're still talking about that i'm excited about all of it you know or combine all of it you know i'm, I'm good for that too so um but this year you know we've had the slime lord that drops in just a couple of weeks and pre-orders already out and, and uh, my mailbox has been jammed about that cover which i'm happy about because that was a nine week project um but also i've got funerary outlook a brand new band coming out and uh, their album will be dropping I've got the, the obscene that I mentioned. And then the really big one is Child Bite, who have just recently been on the tour with Pantera and Lamb of God, and they just played Madison Square Garden. I caught them in a little club about the size of my apartment. And <laughs> three weeks later, they're in Madison Square Garden. That's and nice. they couldn't believe it either. They're just, I mean, they sent me you know video of them backstage losing it, you know. Uh, but they, then I, I saw some uh, camera phone footage of their performance and all that and they looked absolutely dynamite they you know it looked like they handled it like like they've been there a hundred times and mm -hmm. i do feel that when we when we're able to show the child bike cover that that's one of the top three i've ever done in my life and lee i did send it to you you saw it i i told you the same thing i was like this is one of brad's best pieces yeah so technically idea wise and i hated when it was over, when I was painting it and finishing it, and you have to finish it, and you have to have, you have to meet the deadline. And I hated leaving the world of it. I got to where I almost couldn't. I'd, at night, I'd get up in the middle of the night and go, I have an idea to, to adjust a certain thing. I'd get up, you know, and, and fix that, go back to bed. And then I would be, instead of tired in the morning, I was anxious to get up and get back to that to that project. You know, that That's so, that best feeling that you can yeah. never plan yeah. out either. Yeah, you can't but, make it happen. It's the yeah. ellipse where the energy you're putting in is the energy you're getting back. As yeah. I've described in a couple of other talks, um, the best feeling is that the, the work is somehow already there and you're just uncovering it, chipping yeah. it. You know, that, that's what you're doing rather than it's negative space and I'm somehow filling space with ideas and that's it. You know. Yeah. And, and it's a combination of both, but there were times that it was just... I would look at something and, and I go, well, I'm going to put a face in here. And I go, oh, no, this, the brush strokes have, have shown me a much better idea to put there instead of some kind of crazy face or something, you know. So I'd change the sketch and alter it and work it out. And it, and it was just, this was one of those pieces that just absolutely fit together. So I'll be really happy to show that one. 
So that so I've got four covers dropping this year. One of which has been the the slime lord. And then there's a, another couple coming up after summer. I'm supposed to work on. Haven't signed any paperwork. Things could change. So not not a good time to, to speak about it now. But that's yeah. what I'm up to. Like you said, at least six or seven more projects. Oh yeah. well, and so, well, I might as well say this too. I'm working on two eight page comic strips because I got my start in horror gore comics way back in the you know just flat out right out of co uh, art school boom i got hired and doing these these comic books you know doing color color covers and inking and then doing my own strips and doing my own scripts and all that stuff and writing and inking and penciling and just all snowballed and i left that world for a while and now it, i don't know things it's it's people have gotten a hold of me and say what do you think and uh, the offer was good and i said all right but no more than four pages well they talked me into eight and then another guy another <laughs> publisher gets hold of me and says i hear you're doing eight pages for you know what what, what, what would it cost us to get a, a, an eight page strip from you and so it, it it's turned into that and then uh, i'll be doing a cover and some interior work for cursed which lee is part of cursed magazine which is so much like a pulp you know it's like i love that tech pulp magazine you know it's just just yeah. what the scene is needed you know yeah and, and then they hire all the death metal, mostly death metal people, to be the illustrators, which is just a match made in heaven. You know, it's just like it ought to be. And uh, I'll be doing a small drawing for number two, but a cover for number three, and possibly some interiors. That that's number three could be in November. So that that's coming up. So there you go. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. There's actually more than that, but that I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. It props, man. Like I just think of the idea of eight pages for a comic. Like, I, I think I remember when I was a kid, I, I grew up reading comics and everything. I loved the idea of getting into comics. And then I started trying to, like, do layouts and do actual sequential work, you know, with the same characters drawn different positions. And, oh, my God, I hated it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I got so sick of drawing the same thing and having to figure out the layouts. And then I realized, like, oh, I think I just want to do the covers. Yeah. Like, that I want one piece that I work a long time on and, and perfect, and then I'm done with it. I, I can move agree. on to the I, next thing. I, I grew to love that philosophy as well. <laughs> and I, I learned that I'm really not that much of a storyteller, not really, I, or just it's not my real forte. It was just coming up with a you know an image that tells a story, just one image, you know, that maybe have has a lot of viewpoints in it, and that's what I do to this day. And I just learned that by doing comics. You know, I mean, I took the comics gig because it was the gig that was offered to me, and I needed work, mm -hmm. and I was interested. You know, I wanted to do comics. It just I, I was wondering what I was going to do. You know. And then that, that came and it snowballed. And then bands on the road would read these comics and go, let's get a hold of these guys to do our T-shirts and do our album covers. And, and now it's flip-flopped, you know. I work for the bands, you know, and the record companies and stuff 95% of the time. And now comics is slowly creeping back in, little at a time. I don't think I'll do anything above eight pages because it's sure. a hell of a lot of work and it, it really eats into your schedule, you know. And, uh, and I'm thinking now, do I want to get back into this or stay with painting? Cause I want to stay with painting, you know? So I talked them into how about letting me do a painted cover, you know, but I'll be doing an ink, a pen and ink, you know, traditional pen and ink with colors cover for a book called stain. It's going to have alternative covers by Tim vigil and some of the other, some of the other, uh, you know, famous people that are in that stuff. I'll be doing one of the alternative covers for that, but no one, well, possibly one interior, like a pinup page, just a single page drawing. And we're working that out. And then I'll be in Bloody Gore Comics published in Canada. And that's an eight-page story, but I don't know who's doing the cover for that. And then there's uh, one, I'm not really supposed to talk too much about it, that's going to be coming out that also will have an eight-page story. And they're, they're, <laughs> the title might be Funeral, see, what is it, Funeral Void. But there's, it's all still talk at this point. But I've already I've already worked out what the story will be, what the, what the pages will be. All i got to do is sit down and finish them. You know, I've already worked all that out. So, yeah. So there you go. Anyway, I've, I've said enough. <laughs> Dude, the machine. Yeah. <laughs> the, I don't know. Like stuff. <laughs> well, it's all I do. I don't, I don't have another job. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I, I don't, it's just, that's, you know, but, but as I've told Lee and, and some of the other talks we've had at various times in my life, I was doing stop motion effects for B movies. I was doing, uh, I've had a murals group in my town where I lived, which is Carbondale, Illinois. And I did this murals thing where we did murals around town for almost eight years. And I just, you know, I've done all kinds of things. And then I just drift back to what I want to do when I've got money in the bank. But it's all been art, you know. And so right now it's all strictly comics, book illustration, and album cover illustration. And then I, on the weekends I do 
uh, conventions and art shows, and and I do um, uh, three day metal fest, like I was mentioning the Doom Fest and all that. And coming up in March on the sixteenth, I'm going to be in Chicago at Meteor Gem Records. Everybody, anybody in Chicago listening, I'll be there to sign. That that's when Slime Lord drops, and I'll be there to sign copies of that, and I'll be selling prints and posters, and I will have some originals there. So come and check it out. That's awesome, man. You're, you're definitely a testament to like the work ethic that you need to be successful, man. And I hope so. <laughs> always, I'm grateful for all three of you guys for carving out some time today because I know you're all busy. Like, there's an opportunity cost to, you know, doing these things. But at the end of the day, it's also good to meet with like minds, learn some things, and uh, I don't, somewhat giving back to the community too. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. You're welcome. Well, sweet. Um, you guys done a talk process or anybody else got anything top of mind? Uh, I'm ready to go. I'm uh, raring to go. Yeah, <laughs> no, I don't think I got anything else. Yeah, I got that golf game with Mick Jagger at four. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Jesse, you're up first. Yes. All right. Uh, we're going to talk process here, I guess. This... Um, you know, Lee, when you emailed me, um, I think the general idea was it would be good if there was an album cover I could talk everyone through. Boy, you literally did that for 45 minutes on your episode. You know, yeah. And that yeah. kind of, because I've done so few of them, ultimately, um, we kind of exhausted that in the previous interview. Um, I'm sure there will be people watching this who did not watch my episode, but I didn't want to, uh, you know, yammer on about the same shit. So, um this is just a personal piece and this is the last one that i really did of like a decent size um that was just for me and this was um uh, i did this in like the fall of 2022 and i thought this was um an okay one to show um and it was also one of the only ones that i could show because i just like I was going through my photos on my phone trying to find uh, more process shots. And, like, I, I don't know. I guess I must have deleted most of them at some point. So, luckily, I still had some from this thing. So, I was like, let's show this. But, um, so, uh, the panel that you'll see on the left is, this is sort of just how things start when I have zero plan which is most of the time and especially if i'm just doing something for my for myself um so this would have i don't have a shot of it like in its absolute initial stage but the one on the left is a few hours in i'm sure and you know i started with a dark real desaturated sort of teal and just covered the whole canvas with that and started making marks of light and dark and there's really not much else I can say other than the fact that, you know, forms will start to emerge out of that. And I, I saw this large pillar kind of left of center. I thought maybe that would be cool to have like a vertically oriented, um, it's a landscape, you know, but a lot of it is blocked off by this structure or whatever. Um, and then this little, blob to the right of that pillar I realized kind of looked like a figure of some sort um, and I popped a little uh, you know orangey yellow in the background to suggest some lights you know thinking maybe I could do something with that later on um, and at this point too um, I also didn't have I would I don't think I was planning on having um, like a tightly defined perspective. Um, but as I started to see the image take shape, um, you know, I realized like, yeah, I'm going to pop some perspective in here, two points and, um, really try to make it sing with that. So, you know, in the second photo here on the right, you can see, I've got this goofy, like, uh, these cardboard strips taped to each side. And that was something I discussed in the uh, previous interview as well. But basically what I'm doing there is, um, James, I'm sure, you know, digitally, you know, you can just pop your perspective grid in there and like, you're good, yeah. but not, not that I ever use it. 
oh. I know it's there. <laughs> <laughs> I just like props, man, because perspective is the thing that I just always dread. I hate doing buildings. It's but when you do it right, it looks yeah. so good. Nothing else compares. So yeah, so like I mean, it's so cool how you like first draft established like just go big with the shapes. Yeah, just like in establishing the space and the feeling and. Like I said, yeah, I wasn't even planning on the uh, perspective because, you know, uh, you don't necessarily need it, especially if you're making a painting that doesn't have a bunch of clearly defined buildings with hard edges and so on. Like that's when your perspective comes in handy. If you're just doing like a forest or whatever, um, I mean, you know, you, having an understanding and a, a skeleton of a perspective behind a piece like will aid you but you don't always need to be a psycho about it but this one i wanted to keep it pretty tight so the you can kind of see the uh cardboard pieces that are taped on there on the left and right sides of those respectively have a vanishing point um that i tacked another piece of cardboard onto and then just kind of like moved up and down the canvas while keeping it attached to the cardboard. And that basically gives you your perspective grid. Um, so do you like paint actually at this angle? Like the the canvas is just sitting like flat up against the wall in order to get these per perspective lines? Or do you actually um, like work on, on like a stand? It's an easel, yeah. It's okay. a really shitty easel, but it is an easel. And um, yeah, I just, the first step is deciding where your horizon is. Yeah. Um, so generally speaking, if you have a lower horizon point, um, it's going to emphasize things that are in the distance. You know, if you're doing like a big uh, wide open sky landscape, think of something like that. Like the horizon is going to be typically pretty low to the ground. So you can really get the impression of in the scale of this big cloudy sky. Whereas if you move your um, horizon line up, it's going to kind of force you to focus on whatever's in the foreground. Mm -hmm. So I knew that that was kind of what I wanted with this one, because I wanted the eye to sort of in all the detail, really to sort of be in the foreground with this figure and the structure and everything. So the perspective or the horizon is, uh, you know, above halfway there it's a pretty high one and so yeah i mean that's that's how it started and it's funny because when you're painting in the perspective lines you know you you think it's going to look weird you know because the lines the angles seem so severe sometimes yeah but once you start actually making it work you're you know you realize you're just kind of filling it in and like your guide was showing you the way the whole time um so that's yeah, that's about the gist of that second photo. You can see some of the uh, large, like, statue -y type things on the left starting to pop up. In again, none of this is planned. It's just sort of me making blobs and seeing what works and what doesn't. So That's what I think is so interesting, man, is, like, I look at your stuff, and while there's a lot of expressiveness to it and some, like, abstract shapes, like, it feels like a solid dream. So it's like, it's nuts that you just can put down some marks like on the left there. And then you you basically have a complete clear vision that you're just seeing out for the whole time. Cause like for me, I'd have to do, I would do thumbnails and I would kind of like do a little bit of planning, but like mm -hmm. you literally have no planning and like you no. mentioned it maybe as being a, a detriment, but dude, the fact it, that like you can see these things without that is yeah. I, I just amazing. think of my, I, I get so particular with everything. Like I the the idea of having those big chunks figured out just through like eh, I want to do this. Yeah, not saying that you know obviously it takes a certain amount of like you know skill development and your own personal tastes and everything in order to be able to just like do that, but being able to just like, I'm going to try this, but you, you've got so much established pretty early on. Well, and then your perspective just kind of brings out structure. That's, uh, that does so much of the heavy lifting. Like I'll tell you if you, and, and I'm by no means, by no means a master of perspective. Um, you know, I, I understand 
I understand it decently, like on a basic level, but um, it's another one of those things like thinking about light and color where the further you go down into the perspective rabbit hole, the more you realize you don't know. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what if, what happens when I need to paint this like uh, weird circular structure or like a bunch of tires or something like huh. it's, it's nutty. And so when you see a painting and this is just like a very simple two point perspective, but you can do all sorts of things with it. Um, and go nuts but I, I kept it pretty simple here so i guess you can flip the slide um yeah um, one quick thing uh oh, of course. so for the panelists you can click uh the little expand thing and it'll make this a lot easier to like look and see all the details and then obviously for anybody watching the youtube recording you know feel free to go full screen if you're able to it definitely helps out and I'm actually going to mute really quick and stop my camera. I'll be right back in like two minutes. Yeah, Go ahead good. and speak on it, though. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so you can see, obviously, more of this is forming. I think um, I started opening up the sky there a little bit, um, which was not in the previous photo. Um, it, there's like this beam going across the top now that I did not have there before. So really again like even even while i'm figuring out the perspective grid and everything it's like i still don't exactly know where i'm going with it and you know half of the time i'm glad that i'm able to do that um but other times you know i feel like not having a plan can be super annoying <laughs> and oh yeah unplanned the slightest bit no it doesn't any like, evidence of it looking like you've just started just willy-nilly i mean it, it really looks completely prefigured well yeah I, I i i appreciate that thank you and i i think a lot of it too um like i said is when you have those when you have your perspective set in place and you you kind of in your mind know like the general feel of uh what you're going for with it it's having those guidelines in place like really like look at the stairs for instance like both of those stairs are that was just me like following one of those lines and me like oh this could be stairs yeah. so you start to make in a few stairs you you know you attach it to your perspective point on the right and left and make sure it actually works right um but like the lines or a lot of the um, ideas come from seeing this perspective grid ov laid over the space and thinking like, oh, okay, well, I, these couple of lines could turn into this giant block. Like, let's go with that. Um, so, yeah, I, I would recommend toying with perspective. It can lead you to some really interesting places. Oh, yeah. It was something I didn't really, um, and I had mentioned this in the episode I was in last time, but I didn't really... Um, consider it too deeply until I um, made this video game a few years back where I was having to do a lot of clearly defined in a, in a lot of interior spaces too. Um, things in which you simply have no choice, but to, I had to learn the stuff or else you yeah. can't like, yeah. if you don't understand perspective, like you can't even really draw like a bedroom. Like you, you can't, it's not going to yeah. So I, I'm grateful for that experience um, because now, like, I don't factor it into everything I'm doing, like I said, but when I do want to do it, it's, it's just such a good way of establishing a three-dimensional space. Um, and it looks harder than it is, I will say that. Yeah, it always does. It always looks deceptively <clears throat> like it's mathematically impossible. And when I, I've shown people, I said, here, let me just show you what this yeah. is based on. It's based on maybe five lines. Right. When I show them their jaws down the floor, and I said, mm -hmm. see, here's where this part is. And, and you yeah. know, back when I was in comics, well, even now in comics, you can't really start off in comics at all without at least a basic grasp of perspective. Yeah. Anatomy yeah. and perspective you've got to have. Yeah. And yeah. Lighting to a lesser degree in some cases, but you need that as well. But yeah, perspective is, and anatomy are neck and neck. You've got to yeah. have that just, just for your basic draftsman skips, draftsmanship skills to get started in comics. And then it bleeds over into painting and sculpture and everything else too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it bleeds into life too. You know, um, it, that, that's like, um, 
how we always talk about uh, light and color and how that, um, you know, thinking about color and light within your work will feed into your normal life, even when you're walking around, looking at how light and color can transform an object. Well, if you if you have the perspective bug in your brain too, you're going to start looking at everything like that as well and mm -hmm. trying to think like, what am I, <laughs> what am I even looking at? And you know, the world starts to look kind of weird, you know? Um, well, it can even be used towards like completely organic structures. Oh, certainly. Like this type of approach, you can totally like use that on like a face mm -hmm. and figure wow. out, okay, like. With drawing okay. figures in, in perspective is yeah that's it's yeah. tough well, but, I, but like stuff like this helps where you like you know the, there's the classic like exercise of like just turning everything into blocks mm -hmm. it's like okay this is how the light hits and this is how it wraps around and then the, there's the shadow it casts yeah and it's basically just doing stuff like this uh so like especially if you had you know a bunch of like you do have a couple like bits that look like figures and structures like, other than just buildings yeah. but if you say if this was like a action scene where i don't know it was for like a cover of of like a, a fantasy novel or something yeah. where you needed some warriors fighting or something like yeah. that's gonna all play into the perspective that you've established yeah you, you that's why like you need to think about it um it's like the first thing you kind of, if you're going to use it yeah. and really adhere to it in a piece, you need to make sure that you're doing something that's going to serve what you're trying to accomplish because it's, I mean, it's obvious it's, it's, it's the skeleton of the whole space of your painting. Like, you know, here, if I were to have like some, some guys, uh, you know, like sword fighting on the stairs, like in the classic movies, you know, like it would be a pain in the ass because mm -hmm. you're, you have this extreme perspective and you're also looking down on them too. Um, you know, I'm not skilled enough to do that, which is why I just have a little guy like sitting there. <laughs> so um, it's, it's yeah. why I, I totally like, I, I love the idea of being commissioned a piece where it's just a guy standing there looking cool. Yeah, that's, that's I don't have to I do know. any work. That's all I yeah. have. <laughs> just the background. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Well, so, yeah I, mean, I was going to say, this makes me think of a Michael, Michael Whelan sci-fi book cover. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Love that. Thank you guys. Yeah. yeah. Love that guy. One day, one day I'd like to meet him. That'd be cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I haven't, I've never met him. Much. I've talked with him back and forth online a little bit. Okay. Yeah. He, he doesn't give up very much technical. Uh, no, I secret. respect it though. I respect him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I greatly respect him, but I'll ask a few things and, and his answer is a smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, figure it out. <laughs> it's a, which is a really sweet way of saying don't ask you know <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I respect that so yeah with uh yeah i mean you, you can see this piece starting to fill in i open up the sky a little bit um i've got this sort of uh humanoid statues here that kind of started looking bird-like to me um things that are popping up on the pillars i had in mind um like ancient bas reliefs, you know, like when you'll see uh, old surfaces in Rome or Egypt or whatever that are where the figures are carved into the stone itself and they're popping out or whatever. Um, I, I love that stuff. And that's one day I'd like to make an entire painting that just kind of looks like a big bas relief. I think that'd be cool, but I'm uh, that I think is the idea of um, the pillars in this because, you know, when you have the perspective grid in there too, it's like, um, it's great for lining up all the objects, but as you can see, like now there's just these, these plain lines and especially on the pillars where I'm like, how do I kind of disguise that? Because if you just, if you make everything line up perfectly with those lines, it's kind of amateur, you know, it's, it's clear that, you're like, oh, I know how to do perspective. And, like, you know, so, so you got to get a little creative with it so that it doesn't just look like everything is very clearly pointed. Like an and assignment. Like, and then know? it doesn't look like an exercise. Yeah. yeah. So that's like, as the painting goes on, it's like, I got to figure out creative ways to paint over 
those lines, obviously you need to make objects align with them, but the I'm looking to have the fewest amount of just like plain straight lines that are like pointing to yeah. the vanishing points because that just kind of looks cheap to me. Um, well, you could you could tell where you're starting to do it. Whereas uh, mm -hmm. on the left, um, in that main middle pillar, yeah, uh, the part that's getting a little bit more light very much looks like okay. Here's bricks on top of each other, but on yeah. the one on the uh, on the right, the next step, that's where you could tell like okay, now I'm making this a thing that is you know. It's got some wear and tear over time. It's got right. imperfections. Yeah. So it's hiding all of the the math that yeah. you're doing. Exactly. Yes. Giving it personality. It, yeah. You're still keeping. You know, it's all there. It's just you got to right. you got to dress it up, or it's going to look stupid. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's about the next it. one. Yeah, you can go to the next one. I was trying to see. Um, yeah, I think there's parts like in the bottom that I hadn't really figured out what I was going to do with until the next slides. So yeah, the, Whoa. Whoa. the left one. <laughs> yeah. You can, went to town after those <laughs> last two slides. Exactly. Yeah. I, it's yeah. a bit of a jump. I don't think I had any photos. <laughs> you, you've got elves that work and let there be life. <laughs> That's what it's like, man. And suddenly it was done. No, um, <laughs> this, this one too. I remember, um, you know, when I was making it, I was not very hot on it because I thought it just felt kind of one note and boring. And um, this is really kind of the first time I've like looked at it in depth since then. And I, I kind of appreciate it more now I'm finding, but it's uh, always after the fact. Yeah. You know. it's funny. Oh, that is cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I did. I did struggle with this one. I remember. Um, but yeah, I, I quite like it now that it's now that it's done, but uh yeah, I, as you can see, it, this kind of totally goes with what I was just talking about, about trying to disguise your lines. And like to anyone who knows what they're looking at, like it's pretty obvious what I did here, you know, but um, I I just wanted to uh, junk it up with all sorts of little little odds and ends. I I find that I'm happiest when I'm like pulling, getting out the smaller brushes and pulling shapes out of the darkness, yes. basically. and popping some highlights on them and stuff like that. That's, yeah. that's always, always my favorite part. It's fun to be loose in the beginning and the details can definitely drive you insane, but that's really like where the magic happens for me. Well, this is where like the, 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 the work early on pays off. Yes. Because yeah. now you've got that, like that big brick wall structure on the left yep. where you've got those figures within the wall uh, going backwards into the space. But if yep. you hadn't made those grid lines and perspective lines early on, you wouldn't be able to quite figure out exactly yeah. the the different size of each of those going back exactly. and, and the right angles for it. So yep. it, it might look completely off if you didn't do all that work. Plus, like I, I think now the slide before, uh, like Brad had a good point where it, it did look like, like kind of a Michael Whalen piece, mm -hmm. but now it looks like your piece. That's great. Like with with all the details now, it's like okay, that that's your stamp on on this kind of composition, yeah. And that that's where your flavors have come out. Um, Good, but like yeah, it's it rocks. I, I love it. It really this does. Is probably my, this is probably my favorite of yours. That's great because I great. remember you sharing it, being like, oh shit, that that's awesome. Well, and this one I could tell like the the oh. composition like we a lot of us work on uh, um. Uh, album covers. Yeah, this is not something a composition I would normally see for an album cover, right? Because like I'm I'm not thinking about like where the logo goes and, and yeah, all that. Exactly. And where, how your eyes supposed to uh, translate everything at a square format? Yeah, yeah uh, it, the album cover format like is just kind of not my favorite. Honestly, um, it it is fun trying to figure out a front and back, but um, yeah. If I'm painting, having to think about squares, you know, <laughs> working mm -hmm. with a square, um, for some reason that just always feels constricting to me. Um, so, yeah, I, I I prefer a nice rectangle, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I love a vertical. <laughs> sounds so stupid. I'm sorry, but uh, like, yeah. no, no, <laughs> all pieces are great, and and sometimes like the right 
uh, composition for your piece is not always, you know, 12 by 12. No, yeah. You need a little bit more than that. With this one, I, I wanted that. Um, you know, I I find that when I'm making a piece, a lot of times I'll, I'll load it up with all this detail. And like in this case, you've got these two pillars going up that are just crammed full of shit. And it makes me wonder, like, what's above and below the frame, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I hope that is something that the viewer gets too. I think that's part of like why I, I find myself often like loading up corners or like the spots that are kind of out of the way of the main focal point, because it, I like the idea of leaving that in someone else's mind, like wondering what's on the other side of the picture plane, you know, being able to think about how this piece would go on, what the space would actually feel like, what else would be there and so on. Um, in the bottom, it just kind of drops off into mist there on the left. So that's all it needs. I love my mist. I love you know. My yeah, <laughs> I mean I enough of it. Ever, I mean, plenty of artists use that. You know, I, I think people always get on. Um, uh, you know, Rob Liefeld is always the punching bag for <laughs> yeah, trying yeah. to hide his feet. But yeah, I do that shit. It's fine. Pre Frazetta did that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, where it's yeah. just Leho. like, yeah, I, I don't want to do that foot. Let me put a rock in yeah. front of it, or let me put some plants behind it, or some, some mist. mist. Some cool mist. A and it works. Yeah, you know? I love maybe, it. Maybe you don't need to. That that part can just be left to the imagination. It that's cool. It. That's it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's that piece. I think um, I think I called it Avian Temple Ruins, I guess. Uh, there's Good there's, name. There's not any lore behind it. I don't really do that, so... Um, so yeah, that is, that's how I make a painting <laughs> for your final, like what's going on in your portfolio you're sharing with Instagram. Are you scanning or taking a picture? How did you get that I, complete image on the right? Yeah. I take them in to have them photographed, um, by this cool older guy who, um, yeah, I've been using him since I started painting. Uh, so he has a photograph studio like 10 minutes away and I just, I've got a guy just like that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I just run my shit down there and a week or two later, it comes back looking amazing. So I'm very grateful to have that hookup because not everyone has that. So, yeah, I'm always interested in that. Um, very cool. Anybody yeah. else got any comments on this? Oh, go ahead, Jesse. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think having a, a photographer who knows what they're doing is like every bit as viable as a scanner. Like I've never, never had any issues with people being like, you know, this isn't high res enough or whatever. Like, Oh, it looks great. I, yeah. I would have been convinced it was a scan. So he's nope. doing a great job. Yeah. I guess my question would be what type of lighting do you have set up in your studio to, um, to make sure that like you get an accurate depiction of like whatever is professionally photographed or scanned afterwards? Because I know, um, like, if if you have messed up lighting and you know lighting changes throughout the day, yeah, you want to make sure your your colors like are, are reliable and yeah. that they translate. Yeah, that's that's a good question because it's never perfect, but it is something that I just try to make absolutely sure of before I varnish it. That like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's um, my lighting. Basically, I have one like bendy snake lamp above i guess i can just show you let me get rid of my painting here <laughs> i can't uh i can't show this commission but uh oh we saw it you know, <laughs> saw one, yeah. one light there <laughs> one bendy light there one like painter's light up on my curtain rod okay and then on the other side i have like a one of those lamps that's like the octopus style with like four or five bulbs you can move to any angle so so that way I, you're you're getting like an evenly dispersed yeah. amount of light yeah it's not just like one light bulb or anything it's lighting is very important so yeah. yeah you just for me anyway i gotta have it i don't have like a i don't know what other people are doing but it, it works for me i guess and uh the other thing too, um, and I know a lot of people do this, but just um, throughout the process, like looking at the photo on your phone and flipping it into mono, just to make yep. sure all your values are reading. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, like if your values are 
totally solid in black and white, like you're probably going to be good. Even if, yep. you, you know, even if you made some color choices that down the line, you might regret, like at least it's going to read well. Yeah. You know what I'm saying so. Yeah. Anytime something's not quite working or anytime something looks flat, yeah. I'll put it, I'll just put, since I work digitally, I'll just in, in Photoshop, put a color layer uh, over it black. So it can go great gray, gray scale. And it, it usually means that like all oh, my values are not popping. Yeah, like it's it, almost it's, I find it muddle. almost it's almost always contrast or saturation. Like you're yeah. off somehow, you know. Yep. Um but yeah, that's what I got. Sweet. All right, let's shift to Brad. I'll be right back, you guys. Big one. Cool. So for this, we have the finished painting of Slime Lord, and then we're gonna kind of work backwards for the explanation. Yeah. I nine think, weeks. Nine I weeks. think it's crazy, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, their concept was crazy. And I'm I'm yeah. attracted to a band that has a uh, you know an outstanding concept. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because how many burning churches can we keep seeing, you know, and all it's that? True. You know, it's time for something else. And so um uh, and but if, you know, like I said, if somebody's out there doing that, you know, more power to you. But oh yeah. Um this concept by these guys who are an English band is enormous. And the whole album I take it, they haven't been calling it a concept album, but in, it must be because it, the lyrics tell the story, almost gamer style, of this giant frog-like amphibian creature that's never been seen before. And I'm not sure this takes place on Earth even. Crawls up out of the watery abyss and it dies. And it's the size of a continent. And alien or at least unknown or bizarre life forms all go inside and discover it has five stomachs and they've set up civilizations within the five stomachs all of this of course is going to be impermanent because these are flesh caverns that are rotting and some of the little clips of lyrics they showed me and all that stuff this is mind-blowing stuff bacteriological warfare pits uh, i i mean you, you, their, their concept is, is enormous and i really suggested i said hey why don't we go full full tilt and do a you know, 12 or 16 page booklet with illustrations all in it. That was, that w went past the budget, but I don't know, who knows, maybe in a repress, we could do something like that. Cause I had ideas that we could expand this. I could see myself if, if they could just pay me monthly, I would work on this. I would have worked on this for a year yeah. and really made this the sweetest project people have seen in a long time. But uh, you know, time constraints. It's their first full length EP, uh, LP. They've done EPs before that. So that wasn't in the cards this time, but um, I still yeah. saved a lot of sketches and things. There were some wild life forms that didn't make it into this, but that concept that turned me on so much that again, almost like the child bike cover I just finished. I almost didn't want this one to be done. There was, there was a point where I was going, gee, I'd like to get this finished. And then it, it starts feeding you again. And, and uh, I was back into it again, you know, and, and uh, working out the colors and things like that. It all just clicked into place as soon as they started sending me little snippets of the ideas and 30 seconds of a song or whatever. It would just put it all in my head. So cool. And uh, what I've heard of the album, too, they released a single uh, really, really good death metal. Yeah. Um, 20 it's Bucks Spins, obviously consistent yeah. with the quality of the music, too. So it's a, it's a match made in heaven, man. Yeah, it's real technical without being all that noodly. You know, it's not Joe Satriani technical. It's technical in another sense in that the time changes and the time signatures it's done in, and somebody else is doing a sound effect that's coming across and uh, and how it all wraps up and then it goes into other places. It sends your mind into lots of different places, which yeah, is what I really like. There's two and, tracks to make that sort of um, style of death metal that is just sort of... Uh, feels open and like very psychedelic and and mm -hmm. just just strange um I, re I really dig what i've heard from Wait, there's like geese in the beginning of the one oh track, yeah right yeah, I, I was like dude that's <laughs> so badass yeah yeah <laughs> well at first you don't know and then you suddenly realize those are geese yeah <laughs> yeah dude in, so in cool. the context like when you hear that and think about the artwork though like and you know a little bit about the concept it's sort of you know yeah you're listening to geese but it it plops you down into this strange world, you know? Um, yeah. There's so much going on in this piece. It's unbelievable. So yeah. One it of complements the music very well. well I, like I, it's hard to do that. Yeah. It sets the stage perfectly for that kind of music. 
Uh, thank you for saying that because it, it's that's it was immediately the pictures it put in my head, and then they said, "Can we send you some slides of some other artists that we like?" Not not wanting me to copy them, but like to give you an idea of the feel. And they were artists that I've been admirers of for years. A guy named Adolf Schaller who did uh, one of the very first books. It's a book print published by NASA, I believe. I've got it somewhere where it shows alien terrains and alien life forms. And instead of being in the science fiction idea, it's a uh, biological uh, um, investigation into saying, what would it really be like if they, if they lived in a nitrogen atmosphere? What would it really be like if they live in a crushing gravity atmosphere, but this is the atmosphere they live in and so forth. What, what color would the sky be? What, what's the atmosphere like? And this guy, Adolf Schaller hand painted, it's all done traditionally. Uh, did these, these, landscapes with creatures and things and he, it shows all of his workup sketches and how the creatures would breathe and live and all of that and then he does a big panoramic painting and they showed me some of that stuff and, I, and they said what do you think of this guy and i said oh my god this guy's a favor of mine from years back i hadn't been thinking about him for a while and zinnik there was zinnik burian who was a czechoslovakian uh, painter who uh, painted dinosaur and early man uh, murals and po uh, and uh, you know uh, posters and things like that, you know, for, for some of the science textbooks and all that stuff. He was uh, a little bit before Charles R. Knight, who was, I think, the most famous dinosaur painter. Uh, it's like that in that you're seeing a real life animal, life form habitat, and you're looking into it, and it's researched, and it's it, you can back it up. It's not just fantasy, although a great deal of it had to be imagined because we haven't seen dinosaurs, you know, we haven't seen aliens and all that. So I brought all of that into this party and uh was excited to do that i didn't feel overwhelmed by it i i was like holy cow so i had a couple of other little things i was working on i thought get this done get this done get this done i've got to get to the slime lord thing and i and there were still some things that came and went you know where i had to take days off from it but it's been nine weeks to do this wraparound cover it's so cool well, let's dive into the process well it starts with a pencil drawing that you see on the left and uh, and not everything made it into the final thing. Like the actual character that we would call the Slime Lord <clears throat> had a single eye and all that because I didn't have an I didn't have a complete idea for him yet. But I wanted to have an eye organ coming out that has a thing that's piercing it, pushing into it like this, and fluid coming out, and it sees through the fluid. But I could not figure a way to communicate that to the viewer. That would be like a movie or a comic book concept that's told to you in words and, and a series of pictures. So I looked at that and thought, am I going to be able to make this work or will I forever be explaining it to people and they don't get it? So his design, I thought, well, I'll put this in here for now and, and, and keep sketching, keep working. So I'd work a long time. I mean, I work, you know, eight or nine hours a day on this. And then take uh, while I'm eating and whatever, after my shower and all that, I would sit down and start trying to draft out how this character would work. And I thought about parasitic creatures that actually land on him and operate certain parts of him. And uh, it, was, it was yes and no. You know, I kept some of the designs and have them floating around in different places. So what we see in the first drawing and in the middle picture that when I started applying the paint, the, the actual character isn't quite fleshed out yet. But this is what I show the band and the record company and manager. If the manager is interested, sometimes you don't even have to deal with the manager and other times you do, but um, showed them that. So you see that a lot of, if you look at the pencil sketch, a lot of what's in the front or the right hand half is already there. It's in, in which answers the question that I get asked the most people say, do you just make up all this stuff as you go along? And that pencil sketch right there, hopefully answers that question. It's every rock, everything's prefigured in there. Not all the textures, because that would just that would slow up. You know, I might miss the deadline if I showed them every texture and pencil, only to have to redo it again in paint. So you've got a there's a little editing process there. But then when it moves, to, let's say we go to the middle section there. Once they've okayed everything, and this is just the front half, I. It's all done on tracing paper because I'll draw what I like and go there. I've got a good character. Slide it under the tracing paper and trace it off onto the master, as I call it. And as soon as they okay the master, I chalk up the background or, or the back side of it. So if you look in the background of the middle picture there, the one with the brown paint added to it, you'll see some blue streaky uh, marks and lines in the background. And that's all the transferred chalk. And how that happens is I tape it down on the illustration board and trace over it using different colored um, 
colored pencils. And, and I do that because you can tell which lines you've done and which lines you haven't, you know, if it's done in colored pencil. And then it transfers it very lightly onto the board. And then when I paint into it with a liquid paint, because these are liquid acrylics, it dissolves the chalk and there are no pencil lines visible in the original. Oh, wow. So that's what you see. That's useful. Oh, very, very. <laughs> And then I never even thought of something like that. I always thought like, oh, well, you're going to have to eventually cover up your pencil lines. Well, That's... and I used to until I went to art school and learned what they call a lot of the, they call it the old master tricks. And some of them are, some of them aren't, but that it just falls into there. But that was one of the tricks is they, they, call, they called it pouncing. They took charcoal in bags and you wet the paper and it has the drawing on it and you go over it with charcoal like this. It kind of destroys the original drawing, but when you peeled it off of the concrete surface that they were going to paint on in the churches or wherever they're painting, or yeah. it, it was transferred there. So this is a more modern solution to that same idea. So after that, all that, that is done, wild. you very carefully, you have to just start at one end and very carefully trace all of it with the, your paintbrush. And I usually use a fairly big paintbrush. I got like a number two, sharp point number two, to just go over it. And I just let the lines be contour lines, let them be thick and juicy, because it'll all get adjusted as I paint in. And I do change what colors, like you'll see in the middle picture, I use earth tones. It's, it's brown with a little bit of green mixed in it. Green's not really showing up in the slide, but there's a little green stirred in with it to get it organic-y, juicy, mossy. And then in the background, to make it sink into the background, you'll notice now I've gone over those little blue chalk lines with actual turquoise and blue paint. Uh, it just helps keep foreground and middle ground separated. Again, like, like Jesse was talking about with the values, you know, let's reduce it to grayscale and see what pops up. Same thing here. I can do that in my mind, or I can do it right here in this process. And you'll see that the areas that are supposed to be jumping out at us or closest to the viewer automatically look that way from the beginning. So when I send process pictures to the company and to the band, they already can tell that's something in the background, that's something forward. They don't feel like there's something here and something right next to it. It's all, it's, it's already laid out in a, you know, 3D reality uh, that, they, that they can read, you know. And plus it helps me too, because sometimes I'll come back the next day and every now and then I'll look at something and go, what the hell am I doing here? What, what, <laughs> what was my idea? And I'll look at my, I, I do make notes. I look at my notes and I think, what? What was I thinking in this little area? So I'll work on something else, and all of a sudden it'll hit me like a ton of bricks. And it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, that was a smart move. I'm glad I left that. <laughs> That's the way I've always been, though. That's wild, man, that, like, yeah, it, like you were saying, people ask you, like, do you just make this stuff up? And I'd imagine, like, the, the, you have to control this chaos somehow. So, now, like, seeing your process is like, oh, yeah, no, he's got all these creatures and like little planes on which they sit and what the different characters environments are, are actually doing pretty mapped out. And that's, Oh, that's got to help out so much. Cause like I've, I've tried just going like, yeah, let's see what happens if I just yeah. make some lines and stuff. And it's always like a mess and it doesn't make any sense. And like, there has to be some sort of, if you're doing stuff like this, there has to be some sort of like purpose behind the different things that are happening, even if they are more abstract and surreal looking. Yeah. They have to, they have to make sense. They have to make yeah. sense in the world that you've created, you know? Yeah. yeah. Cause there's no such thing as total freedom. There really isn't because, and you don't want that. You want to have a no. defined parameter and what happens in there has to fit in that parameter. Otherwise you're, you're failing somehow. You're taking a piece of a puzzle from another puzzle that doesn't fit, you know? And uh, some people say, Ooh, this color looks good. Put that in this picture, but it, but it may not fit the picture. You know? Right. And uh, and there's times I've had to wrestle that with people like, oh, the bass player's girlfriend thinks there's not enough pink, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, pink is it her, happens. Her, her spirit color, and so she's wanting to know if we can add more pink. And I'll say, exactly where do you see that pink will fit? <laughs> yeah, but that's only happened less than a handful of times. But there have been there have been things like that. You know, I've, I've been asked to put in some things that I really had to talk some guys out of. <laughs> it really did happen. As as somebody like. Oh, that's got to be even harder for you guys because you guys all, you know, work traditionally. So it's not as easy to just like mock up something that's the alternate version of what they want. With me digitally, I'd, I'd like, like one time they're like, oh, what if we did a red background? But like a lot of the stuff in the, in the foreground was warm colors and we wanted a cooler color in the background to make sure yeah. that like it, it separates nicely and pops off of it. And I was like, well, you guys are attached to the idea of this color. Let me show you real quick what it looks like with this background. Because I work digitally, I could easily just like plop that in, 
then they saw like, oh yeah, that doesn't work. Right. Leave it blue. Or to like, oh, I love it. Like, oh. oh or yeah. And you're <laughs> just like, ah, crap. <laughs> now, you're sure they're going to go, well, they won't, they won't say yes to this schlock. And then they go, yeah, that's what we're talking about. That happens sometimes too. <laughs> well, and that one and the other, the only other problem is you've got the finished work and then they've sat on it for a couple months because they're still in the studio or whatever. And they get a hold of you and, hey, had some ideas we want to run by you. Get in touch. So we get in touch. We want to take your painting and then turn it. We love it. Love it. Love it. Turn it completely around and take one of the characters from the front and put him on the back and then but kind of flip him in the other direction. So it makes sense. <laughs> That'd be cool. Right. We'll show you a mock up. And it looks so bad. Yeah. You just want to, you know, that's a, you just want to end it right there, you know. And, and, and I say, and you guys, you sent me that and you think that 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 looks good to you. Seriously or what? Yeah. Or someone telling you that that looks good. So I'll get into the big rolling argument. And be able to twist them back around. I said the original idea is this, and it works as the original idea. Don't you know? Don't let somebody in the ninth hour come into you and tell you, "Well, you know, I saw some guys doing this. That was cool." And then everybody else is, you know, they're full of doubts and thinking, "Well, yeah, maybe that would be cool." You know, so you know, be prepared. I'm I'm always telling other other you know artists starting out or struggling, be prepared. You're going to have these days. You're going to have those trials, and you got to stick to your guns. Stick to it. I know you got you know your car payment coming up and you need this paycheck, but stick to it because your name is on there. Yeah, somewhere it's credited to you, and if it's all screwed up, you know you won't want to you won't want to keep living with it. I um I helped design a, a tile mural. In other words, it was done with ceramic tiles that had designs on each one of them. A lot, a lot of work, and it involved about ninety different artists at our local college and and some of the high school kids and stuff like that in our in our area. And I was involved in it along with another art person. And we helped put it together. And I had an idea for this illusion that it would have on the wall. And it would all be made like in ro vertical rows, triangular like my hand is. And on that side is an image. And on this side of the triangle is another image. So when you come into it, looking at it from the left, you see a picture. As you pass it, it changes to an entirely different picture on the right. And they thought that idea was fantastic. And then, and so I went through all the work of designing it. Hell of a lot, weeks of putting this together. And so I showed him, I made a small mock-up. I said, here's what it'll look like. And even showed them by moving it. Here's how the, uh, here's how the illusion will work. I said, you, there's nothing like this in town or anywhere near here. I said, we can win awards with this. Come back later and they go, well, we showed everybody. And they're going, nah, we just want to go with something that shows traditional local values. And right then I'm like, <laughs> seriously you can have something that people it would be you know a tourist attraction seriously if they had got with the money they were putting into this yeah they could have made this one of those things where you go and by the way before you leave town check out this you know because nobody's yeah. nobody's nobody's got this and and i kept telling them no one's got this we could do this i said and we've gone through your budget it's all it all fits no we just want it to be so anyway it became something else that i felt was very substandard but i said okay i was already signed on to this so we did it and on the back of each one of the tiles it's just a flat do nothing picture in my mind uh, it just says row a1 a2 a3 a4 a5. they did it backwards they started with a26 a25 a24 i can't believe it and put a oh. whole section completely reversed and when you look at it it is so awkward <laughs> <laughs> plaque that has the names of everybody in charge and i said I, I will pay you money to take my name off that and they're like, mr moore why you know and i i told him, i said flat i said i never i never want to be involved in this now of course people in my hometown are what might be watching this they're gonna know <laughs> it's in the courthouse it's right there in the courthouse you know it's it's a classic example of too many cooks in the kitchen yeah. you know like obviously the like makers don't know anything about what they're talking about they just go eh, you know yeah, and, and like I think a certain amount of like what you're paying the art artist for is for their taste and their ability to tell you like this works, this doesn't. Now yeah. the, the artist isn't always right. Sometimes like the the client will bring up something where you're like, oh shit, I didn't think of it. Let me try that. And that's why it's fun as a collaborative process. But there has to be a certain amount of trust where like the if the artist tells me this doesn't look good or this is going to take too much time or this is completely different than what you told me you got to be able to trust them with that because they're the person you're paying to have a good creative um opinion on this sort of stuff yeah, yeah the, the top decision makers are guys that don't know any of that yeah. not at all 
Uh, it reminds me of a story, and I believe I brought this up during a meeting at this project. Um, the makers of the Married with Ch Children TV show took their idea around several places before Fox, you know, uh, licensed the show. And every, at every case, they said, well, we've looked at your idea and think it's funny. Here's how we want to change it. And right there, you know, the grown. Let's make the, the, the husband and wife truly in love with each other instead of this bickering back and forth. And let's make them really supportive of their kids. And I said, well, that was the program. That's the exact opposite of what the program is about. So the, the two guys who created that show said, you're the reason why television sucks. And we'll keep working our day jobs until we get somebody who says yes to the project the way it is. Let's and take thought, away the conflict that is the whole point of the show. The whole, whole point of the show. Yeah. <laughs> the whole point of the show. But so anyway, those, the guys that wanted to change my artwork on the, on the album cover, this was years ago, too, that I was talking about. I wanted to flip the characters and all that. I, and they said, but but Brad, it's still your work. It's still got your name on it. It's still your work, brother. Just, you know, like that. And I said, um, okay, let's say the record company then says, we're going to replace all your vocals with uh, yodeling. But it's still your lyrics, brother. We're all working yeah. together as a team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how does how does that go down, you know? Oh, we're going to take the drums out, too. It's just, it's just going to be no percussion. But your name is still on all of the, all the composer credits. It's still you, brother. Have we got a deal? See what I'm saying? Uh, who's going to say yes to that? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but it's still your stuff. It's still you. Uh, it, it, and that's what they were telling me. You know, like, like I'm going to fall for that. And I'm sure that some younger artists, you know, and people who might be desperate in their lives. Yeah. They're going to have to, they're going to be forced to say yes. Oh yeah. There's, there's, there's always a certain amount of like push and pull with clients. And it's not until, Unfortunately, sometimes where you actually get the experience of having done a couple and and show that like, hey, I've I've got respectable work, and I don't. There is a, a little bit of a feeling of like, I'm worth your time and money, so you need to trust me. Yeah. Uh, and you can use that, and you can try to do it in a way that that you know you're. You know, you you're ultimately both trying to make a really cool looking product, but sometimes you there is a certain amount of like, hey, I trust me, trust me, mm -hmm. I know what I'm talking about. Well, uh, maybe this has happened to either of you. I get a, a couple of bands that will say, we want the darkest, scariest thing, the scariest, most hardcore <laughs> thing you can come up with. <laughs> so I will, I will draw it up, and as soon as I show it to them, they go, whoa, whoa, boy, back <laughs> off. <laughs> like on uh, slowly we rot like a guy in the street and he's a corpse you know? <laughs> and that was you know that's that's a fine cover but i said well now that's not what we said on our first meeting you said you wanted the most you know you want to just have people just look at it and go oh you know and so they, they don't really want that what they actually want is the next best imitation of something they already like you yeah. know and uh, you oh, gotta yeah. keep that in mind that's just people that's all people they go, go yeah. you know, uh, Hollywood is interested in. We want something that's a cross between Twilight and a Jerry Bruckheimer film with explosions, but a meaningful love story. Have you got that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know yeah, I think as they go, yeah, this director, he's no good. His project bombed. You know, of course, they, they switched everything he wanted to do around. So, you know, again, more advice to anybody listening try, try if you can, stick to your guns. I mean, yeah. always listen to advice. Always listen to criticism and and really have a spirit of discernment, self judgment, being able to self edit. Is this the best way? I'm never going to be one of those artists that says no. I put that line there and I'm not moving it. And I'm sorry, screw you. I'm never going to be like that. But um, because many times I've, things have been suggested compositionally or something else that was like excellent. Didn't see that way. I'll try it and I try it and it works. Yes, of course. Yep. But some of this other stuff is that going too far is going too far. You know. That, that is how I look at it. And every, every one of us, you know, are not immune. None of us are immune to that. And honestly, like the um, clients that I've had the best time working with in terms of like <clears throat> taking their edits and taking their um, like personal opinions, like a little bit more like, oh, yeah, that, that is a good point. It's usually because they have worked as like designers of some kind mm -hmm. in their past. And they, they kind of know what they're talking about and they're able to, to view it you know, a little bit more uh, objectively, but with that sense of like design experience in their background. And they usually have the most um, useful advice in terms of edits along the way. Yeah. So I always appreciate that. They can be your champion too, to like steer a voice of reason. You yes. know what I mean? 
you need mm-hmm. that person in the in the in the crowd. You, you do if you can find that person, you know, and, and and often you can. You very often can. It's just those times when you're cast adrift in a bedpan, you know, <laughs> and they're going, "We've we've got this guy," you know. <laughs> I got I got a quick logistical question. So let's say you can tell that there's this type of scenario coming up. Is it like two emails back and forth? And it's like, all right, when you have a phone call, like like how does it usually pan out for you guys? Uh, for me, it's been mostly through texting and emailing and yeah. and the occasional Zoom meeting. I just did one um, um, a, a week ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the Zoom meetings are good because you can show your examples and talk and you, you talk back and forth right there. And if there's any uh, lack of communication or lack of understanding, uh, misunderstanding, that can be you know worked out very quickly. And, and, and that's really good because everybody wants to everybody wants to, to have it work out. I mean, I'm sure everybody would like to have everything done overnight. I know about that, but you know, it, it, that's, that's not always possible. It's always, if we could get it sooner though, are you sure now? You know, I, I would like it. I like it when the publishers uh, will say, do you need any more time? This is looking really good now. Are we, are we pinching you? And that's happened a few times. Would you like another, like another two weeks? And they'll give a reason why another two weeks is totally feasible. And I, I'll say yes. Just that's the dream. Yeah, it is. It happens, it happens a, a time or two. It does, but not always, because a lot of times they've put the ads out for the product, yeah. and it's already gonna. It's supposed to hit the stores at a certain time. The distributors have already been paid a little bit up front, so they've got to have it, you know, to be able to distribute to stores. Sometimes there's just no way to add any more time to it. I try to tell that to people all the time who say, "But yeah, you're doing the cover, man. Just make them wait. Make them wait. Just just take the time. Why don't you do that?" And I said, "Boy, you really have no idea the reality no. at all." And it's a business, but they think that you can sit back and just play God and go, they're getting it when they're getting it. Now, there's not less than a handful of people on planet earth that can do that. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, it, Unless like you're one of the, yeah, the top five folks who can do that. It's usually yeah. like, we need to print this at this time, which means we need the art by this time. Mm-hmm. It needs to be done. Period. Yeah, uh, they have it like, in hand by whatever. And this mm-hmm. is why. Yeah. yeah. It's also, I always find that I need to have my, actual painting done like almost a month before the actual deadline because like there's always just some sort of time consuming bullshit that's going to get in the way of Mm -hmm. delivering that final product whether it's uh you know taking it to have it photographed or whatever like i mean just life gets in the way well yeah all the time all the time and Mm -hmm. so i always have the deadline on the calendar and then it's like at least two weeks before that, I'm like finish painting by his day yeah. and deliver I, it by X date. You know, I have at least three calendars because I have to write so much stuff that right. I'll draw an arrow to the next one <laughs> because I needed more space on it to write. <laughs> well, Lee, if you want to, we can move to the next couple steps. Oh, that, that was that was good though. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, so now th- these. These two shots, I think, work nicely because you can actually see the difference between working on the underpainting and then what it turns into. So the underpainting, of course, is on the left, and then following the process, what's in you know, what it turns into is on the right. And I got these almost exactly the same angle; it just worked out nicely. So continuing with that blue line, none of this is in the chalk now at all. On the, and we're talking about the piece on the left or the part of it. Um, the blue line is for the, everything that's in the background. And there was quite a lot in the background. But then you'll notice I, I apparently break my rule. If you look, there's some creatures and you know, character things and some plant life down in the very foreground that I went ahead and did the blue for. And what happened was I was I have big blocks of illustration board that I cut. They're just chunks you know, for nothing else. And I test things. And I discovered the certain colors I was going to use for those creatures that you're going to see down at the bottom there when they're fleshed out looked really great with that blue in the as the underpainting. And I thought, what? Well, and I discovered that that was that was one of those happy accidents. And I thought, all right, then I'll continue with this blue because you at that point when you get to the to the finishing point, you can adjust enough that nobody's going to say, hey, you you used a background color in the foreground. Why'd you do that? It won't show. So I thought that I could cover my tracks if anything did go wrong. It, it, nothing went wrong at all. It was one of those, like I said, again, I don't really believe in happy accidents, except that they do work and they happen. So if you trust for them to happen, they probably won't. They just somehow do. And in that case, you know, the blue line worked on that little crabby looking creature that's down at the bottom. But you see the major parasitic creature in the middle with all the tentacles. And by the way, death metal love um, insect like legs they love tentacles 
Uh, I mean, if you do that stuff, you, you know, you're, you're guaranteed for people to go, oh, oh more of that, more of that. I really like that. Yeah. People really <laughs> respond to that alien quality. One thing I like about the from the left slide to the right is there's this creature um, on the right foreground, kind of like halfway up that uh, it's sort of in the left. Like it, it reminds me of like a crinoid fossil or something. Yeah. And in, in the left, it's just this stubby little thing, but in the right, it's sort of sprouted these tentacles as you, yeah. as you yeah. render it and it comes to life. It's uh, I can see the tentacles pop out and it's very I, cool. They were planned and they're in the pencil drawing, but okay. I left them out in the left-hand side because I have to paint the background first. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't want to have to paint around tentacles No, and have, you know, and there's, there's it just, I don't know that it's just, it's uh it comes out clumsy. So when that was fully dry, that I went ahead and just put the, the chalk drawing back down again and drew, traced off the tentacles. When you lift it up in chalk, it shows you where they go. Yeah, and I was able to paint them in there with no sweat whatsoever. Yeah, I love, that, uh, love that heavy indigo sort of color on it too. It's gorgeous. Yeah, so. yeah that's a uh, straight violet with uh, Payne's gray number four mixed in with it. Okay. And then when it dried, it's a thin, thin coat of true blue zero zero three or something like that very thinly over it which i had done before and i knew how good it would turn out it was like yeah. Yeah, i know that that will work that's, that's a great combo right there looks nice. and i used thank you and i used part of that over there on the on the right hand or on the left hand part of it on that mm -hmm. slimy mound of flesh too because anytime i've got paint mixed up and there's some left over I'm, anytime i load the brush anytime i look at anywhere else in the picture that maybe oh. i'm not working that that might go right yeah because, and then if i don't like it when that when i get to that and that's dried up i just cover it up Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it does provide something, you know, really, really good. I mean, it really makes a, a another surprise element that you go, yeah, you know, that's, yeah. But, then, but then, you know, I've always think my mind is, has been working ahead thinking that that might work anyway. I right. just don't know. When you get into the zone, as we all talk about, it's, it's just magical. It, well, I don't even like to use the word magical. It's just this great energy train thing that just continually keeps feeding. And sometimes I have to quit only because my eyes are burning so badly. I can't keep going. I'll and paint a little bit and wipe, paint a little bit and wipe, and I stop and lean back. And I think, ah, I don't want to quit. I, this is just, it's singing. And I've got to stop because my eyes are just like, they're just running down my face, you know. Um, and sometimes I'll come back in a couple of hours, or sometimes I'm done for the day. But um, many times, many of the days on the working on this one, it just, the whole thing was just an opera, just working together. You know, it just, it just never, there never was a part where I went, Ooh, I misjudged this. And then, you know, that'll happen a time or two. And it didn't on this one. Yeah, it's good. It's wild seeing like the complete tonal change on the left from this yellow blue background that you've got towards the top where it, it seems to be the, the, that basic outline to orange purple. Yes. And, and like, it's, uh, is is that through just like the 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 paint reacting like the warmer tones reacting to the blues below it and turning it purple, taking it oh. so so thin with the layers. Yeah, it actually just it not only knocks it further in the background, it changes the tonality. Yeah, like that's that's why like it's such a cool idea of playing with that. It's why I'd I'd, I'd like to get more into traditional work again, just because like these these reactions that the paint have to each other and, and like you were kind of saying these happy accidents that happen with you just kind of putting colors in some places that feel right yeah uh sometimes that's just like the best feeling mm -hmm. yeah you uh, end up with stuff you didn't even expect that way yeah just oh, yeah. blazing and layering and you you even have like you know your final painting with a spot of color and it's like you can more or less zero in on how you did it but you might not remember exactly how you wound up with a certain color and it's it's nice to have that element of surprise in the process you know i've got huge stacks of notes i probably will you know, once a time or two i'll go back into them going how did i get this certain shade of whatever to work on and i'll go back and reread what i did so maybe somebody in the future when i'm long gone could benefit from it i don't know but and the written is such a way that only i can read it you know? of course. it's just, yeah. such a shorthand in my mind you know but um i've just got a huge thick I mean, with paper spilling out all over it of just all my ideas and I'll flip back through it and 
realize what colors I used and, and how I blended certain things together or what things worked as layers and what things didn't, what things worked as undertones. And I found that certain colors as, as the underpainting just work every time. And so I do stick with a lot of that. So that yellowy brown you see in there is actually more of that, uh, uh, it's like a forest brown, but it's got green added to it. However, when you thin it out like I did, like on the one you see on the left, it appears yellow. And then that kind of, and I knew that so that when I put the orange on there, which actually is chrome yellow, I hate to tell you, it's chrome yellow, but it becomes orange when you put it over those layers. Yeah. And, and then you get this, it looks like the texture is reflected in purple. It almost looks like it's solarized in purple. And I only touched up little parts I wanted to show up with natural purple, purple mixed with a little bit of light blue to, to lighten it. I almost never add white to anything unless that's the only thing that will work. And you'll see that occasionally. Some people say, you, you have some white highlights. I go, well, look really closely. If you look at the colors around it, you can tell those aren't white. But, um, but because when I was a younger painter, I used white way too much. I just I thought everything, I thought light had to be white added to it. Slowly yeah. learned and then going to college and learning and all that stuff, that, that that's not really the real case. That's always the, the, the rookie's approach. It's like, if it's it darker, I add black. If it's yeah, lighter, yeah, yeah, I never, add white. Really, black, and everything ends up looking never washed out and black. gray. Yeah, never have pure black in a picture. No, you should never. Just It looks like a dead, it looks like a place that hasn't been worked out yet. Yeah. And, and it'll reproduce very poorly most of the time. For blacks, I really use a, a mixture of, of dark browns and dark blues and dark purples. And I've been changing that up slightly. Um, just to, to kind of, and there's a, there's a color called nautical blue mm -hmm. that if you paint it over brown, if you mix it together, it makes a sludgy nasty color. But if you let the brown dry and then paint the nautical blue over it, you get what appears to be the most deep black and it's not black. Mm -hmm. it's bit. And I know there's a painter I admire. His name is Jeff Jones who did that. And he added mm -hmm. a median yellow to it. And I can't imagine doing that because yellow with black makes this nasty greenish color. And it made these deep blacks for him without ever using black whatsoever. And then you've just got like pieces that are full of like richness and color. Uh, and and the, but still have the values that you need. So yeah. it's, it's why it's good to, to always like bring uh, other people's work into like a color picker online and just like, you know, Okay, let me try out see what this really this highlight is. It's like, yeah. oh, it's actually like just a very saturated yellow, or sometimes in skin tones, like, oh, that's not pink or tan. That's actually just kind of like a weird looking green. But yes. when it's put next to this color, it looks like it's tan. Yeah, underpainting on human flesh has a lot of blue and green in it, mm -hmm. and then you paint over it and let that show through as the as the the gradation in color. Awesome. Well, now we see the front half of it, and we're, let's look at the left part first. Uh, that's most most of the front half, and it, you can see it, it came together on the first. You know, uh, when, when when I follow my own process, it came together on the on the first try through, and then the other picture on the right hand side is zoomed in on that upper right hand corner. You see how small that upper right hand corner is, mm -hmm. and that's how much that I managed to put in there. There's a face with a kind of like a, a carved mask of some kind, yeah. tribal mask and spike tongues coming out of it. And um, it also looks like an alien craft that had landed. And I had thought about making some kind of mechanical thing, but it just, it didn't suit the picture. But, but what I want to talk about is you see this almost crazy gothic -y bell looking shape here because the beckoning bell was the name of their first single and, and a bell, is a big part of what happens in the story of this album. So I've begun the ringer in there is a crystal piece of crystal that's supposed to ring back and forth. Now that's not my idea. That's a concept that's within the lyrics. And what happened was I did this thing that you have to slowly put together in your head that that's a bell, but that might be the kind of bell that's created by some kind of alien life form. Right. Uh, when we get to the back of the painting, I've got an actual sunken bell there that's ripped open and it has a Lovecraftian creature nestling inside you know and, and we'll see that so in two ways i've included the bell which is a big part of the artificial mythology that the band had came up had come up with for this album concept and uh, but i like that close-up because it lets you see and that's not quite a finished area on that right hand side not quite it's a little bit rough but it shows you really how hard I, and i like people to know that how how hard i will work to make these images have a reality to them how much i will actually dedicate to getting the texture and getting the feel right because i know when i draw it out with lines i can tell in my 
head what the tactical qualities are, how, how it feels. How do I communicate that to the person looking at it? That's the hard part. In fact, I think that's the art part. I want people to feel when they look at this the same way I felt when I conceived it. And, uh, and I think this is one way of showing you how I go about doing that, whether it's successful or not. I think layouts like these and the amount of detail and just like the, the storytelling that's all inside of this, even though like maybe somebody who, you know, is just seeing it in an instance might think like, oh yeah, it's a bunch of gooey stuff. Right. Like, the, like it pays off the more you look at it. And that's a you, see, you see all of these creatures and these little storytelling things and just like little world building stuff that is all in there. The more you look at it, it just pays off the 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 longer you look at it and the closer you look at it this is why i always like even if you don't have a, a vinyl uh player i recommend people just getting <laughs> yeah. the, the lp because that's that's the best form of that artwork that you're going to be able to buy outside of you selling like a print or something yeah and that's going to show everything off that the artist put into it uh it, in in the best scale you're likely to find it outside of buying from the artist uh, directly. Outside so, of the original, yeah. Yeah, so details like that, just, you know, when you, when you get it, I, I love getting CDs, you know, they're great for the car and everything, but I'm sure you guys have seen, like, your stuff printed, you know, at that scale, like, oh, man, you can't even see all the work that I put yeah. into it. It's just so small. Yeah. But I love getting a record and being able to actually see all those details, stuff like this. I just love just getting lost in. Yes, yeah, yeah. I've, I've had people look at the CD version and they'll say, "Oh, I like that you put a seahorse and something in there." And I go, "There's no seahorse in that." <laughs> <laughs> that's that's nice of you to say. Yeah, but I just hate to tell you this. There's not. <laughs> I had a guy who said that he told me he thought that I had hidden the shapes of guitars in that, and I said, "Well, I didn't." I said, "But show me where you think that you see that." So he. Took a picture of the, I think the front half of this, and there's just these green outlines, real rough, of where guitars could fit in, and they don't fit any shape that's in the picture at all. So I don't know what he's seeing. <laughs> <laughs> They're just randomly on there like stickers. It's like <laughs> <laughs> so I just sent him the blue thumbs up and left it. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm glad you get that out of it. <laughs> I, I, I was. I was glad that he's looking yeah. at it and seeing something in it. Okay, I just didn't, uh, you know, because I've got a lot. There's some scurrilous details in that. If you look above the 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 slime lord's head there there are vaginas in the walls with tongues coming out of them. Yes, oh yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. see a lot of people kind of afraid to say are those vaginas but they they smile and look away <laughs> but yeah, i want but... to be that way because you know there, there's the the human the fear of the human body there's the there's the, the the aspect of loathing the aspect of disgust and you can't just draw slime on everything because people just get used to looking at that so what other what other you know aspects of this in human psychology can i utilize to make people either comfortable or uncomfortable or, or to show them uh you know that there can be another reality that, that sometimes nature can be horrifying mm -hmm. you look at certain things that happen in nature and go holy cow that's like a night if that was 30 foot long instead of something microscopic that would be an absolute nightmare and all of this really exists in nature so how do you you know again there's a notion that's an abstract notion how do you translate that to make people feel that same way. And that's what I thought this cover should feel like is that aspect of the horror of nature. At the same time, it has to be a picture you like to look at. You want to put your eyes on there. You like the colors, you like the, the spatial relationships and such. And I, and I do that with all, all the works, but you know, this one as well. Yeah. It's just sort of this, this slab of, um, uh, I, <laughs> unbridled replication and it's like life spewing out of itself unbound um yeah. it's yeah it's wild to look at and i think uh you know kind of what you were saying about so much of nat the natural world being just full of all sorts of nasty repulsive shit um it's it's funny to think about that and i think that sometimes uh even the gnarliest, weirdest things that we can conjure in our minds have some sort of real world analog. Yes. Um, whether or not we're even aware of it. I think sometimes, uh, maybe it sounds a little crazy, but it's almost like we're wired to uh, be able to sort of summon those things from 
somewhere um, and they find their way into the artwork. I'm, I'm wording this horribly, but... Um, no, actually, I agree with everything you just said. That, yeah. That's kind of what I was going to say. So, I mean, you've done it for me. That's that's right. It's yes. di dipping into, again, when I said, how do I make somebody feel like what I was feeling? It's because I want to tap into the thing that I know it's in everybody. Right, exactly. You know? I mean, people stop to see, slow down to see a car accident. You know, they slow down. You see a dead animal on the road. And you maybe seen it a hundred times and you, you do look. You know, and it's like, oh, look what happened. You know, that kind of thing. So, and that's a form of revulsion, but it's also a form of curiosity. And that's in all human nature. It's, it's in everybody. So how do I tap into that? You know, I just tap into mine and do the best job I can in communicating it to yours. You know, that that's that's the only way you can do it. Um, and But I often wonder how successful it is. And so like when I listen to somebody who says he sees guitars in it and stuff, I think, <laughs> well, you know, but that's, that's this. He just he looked at it and that's what he thought he saw. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's why I, I hope he doesn't think if he's listening that I'm putting him down. Not not at all. Not no, no, no. Yeah, that, I, that's the funny thing about doing pieces or having a style like this where you'll have these large masses of, of organic matter um, and you might not be able to discern exactly what it is, but it it almost uh, takes on the quality of watching clouds, you know, and I, I have to yeah. remember that when I'm putting something out like this, I can look at a section of a painting and it can look like one of five things at any time. Yeah. And, and you never know what people are going to pick out of it. Um, and it's like the guitars thing, you know, it's a, it's a funny example, but you know, uh, that's what that person sees. And you, you can't account for that when you make the painting, you know, that's right. Yeah. You can't, you, you can't account for it at all. Yeah. Um, and, and I know this when I'm, uh, that still stays in my head anytime I'm creating a piece that I often wonder what somebody's going to get out of this. And sometimes I'm amused and sometimes I'm not angered, but kind of shocked at what they get out of it. Or I'm shocked when they miss the big picture that was, that was in it that I think is in your face and they didn't see that part at all, you know, yeah. but that's how we, that's how we're all going to be. That's, that's just not going to change. I mean, I had a, a big painting I sold years ago of just a, it's not that complex of a thing like this. It was a zombie biker riding through a graveyard and, and I made a great big print of it. It was about five feet long or whatever. And I laid it down on this pool table. We took it to, where was it? I don't know, Chicago, something like that. To so this guy who said, I'd like to have a big print of this. And he, he paid me at this art show. So I had it made and we laid it down on a pool table for everybody to see. And there was a guy and all it is, it's a zombie biker on a motor, on a chopper, holding a beer, going <laughs> through a, going through a, a, a graveyard. And he Hell looked yeah. at it and he looked sideways. And he looked back and he stood back and he goes, I don't know. What, what is it? I don't know what I'm looking at. And, you know, and I've run into those people. And I said, you see this face right here, this skull face? He goes, I mean, he's like, kind of, yeah. You know, I mean, it was, and he wasn't, he wasn't playing around. He, he couldn't get it. My dad was like that. If I showed him something I did, he immediately would turn it upside down, sideways. He'd go, what the hell am I looking at? Yeah. He did that constantly. And it could be a picture of a dinosaur. It could be a picture of a hot rod. He didn't have, there's a certain perceptual thing certain people don't have. And that those are the people who don't like art and say it doesn't make sense. Because yeah. them, you know, it doesn't make sense. And so I run into that. <laughs> I've met a few people like that. And yeah, it's uh, very bizarre. <laughs> funny, funny, funny story. I hope I haven't told that on, I've told this on here before, but doing an art show, an exhibit oh, a long time ago, 10 years, more than 10 years ago. And we were talking, we, we saw a guy kind of coming in and out, really out of place. He had his hands in his pockets. He just didn't look like he was the type of people to be here. And he's not interacting with anybody. And he's kind of looking around and not really, he's just kind of fidgeting. And we kept saying, he's either here to pick up somebody or, you know, he, or he doesn't know where he is. We, we had this little mythology made up of what this guy was about. So finally it was time to go on a uh, uh, lunch break. And so, we we're going to leave somebody with my setup. And the guy finally comes over to me because there's nobody there. Just me and the guy I'm telling what, you know, how to take care of the setup while I'm gone for lunch. And he comes over to me and he looks around. This is the first time he's even approached. And he looked up at me and he goes, so and this is the truth. He said, so, so this is that art stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. This is an art art show. We're trying to be polite, trying not trying not to snicker. And I'm, believe me, I'm holding it in too. And, and I'm not kidding. Here's his next quote. He goes, so and he looks around like the Mona Lisa, but different. 
Yeah. I'm, is this yeah. an alien? No, well, <laughs> if you've seen this guy, you, you know. His uh, second time viewing art, you know. I, I, I wish that could be me. That'd be crazy. He wanted, to, he wanted to, I don't know, he passed by or what? whatever. He was aware of the art show and wanted to be a part of it and had no clue how to get into it at all. But we've used that joke. When I say we, me and my, my buddies that you know do this stuff, we have used that joke so many times. When we see somebody else like that, we go, so so like the Mona Lisa, but, but somehow different. It's like that. Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> hilarious. Well, it, it's similar to the, and maybe this has happened to you, you guys. You can put your best stuff on display, and there's some guy that comes in there who's unfamiliar with it, and that's fine. Who tells you he's got an aunt, a sister, an uncle, a cousin who's way better than you? And yep. uh, and you say, well, well, okay, well, you, can you show me on your phone or show me some examples? No, you just you just have to see it. And I go, well, what kind of stuff does your aunt paint? Oh, they're just really great. Well, like what? Describe one of the paintings. I, I don't know. You just you just have to look at them, and they're just incredible. And then I said, so they're so awesome, you can't describe even one of them. Are there people in the picture? Is it an outdoor scene? What is it? You you just you just have to look, man. It's it's awesome. You can learn a lot from her. It's like a picture of a sailboat, you know. <laughs> what do you say to that though? It's like okay, okay. What's your what's your aunt's name? Well, she's not online or anything. It's like oh, <laughs> that this is yeah. how it goes. It goes that way verbatim. Uh, the other one is. I've got an aunt, brother, cousin, whatever, and they can and, and they do like the pencil drawings of people's babies and people's dogs, and they make it look exactly like that. And I said, yeah, that's. Uh, I said that that's tough to do, and then they look right at me and go, well, you you know, you could do that. You you maybe you should get into that. Yeah, they, they don't <laughs> they don't get that it's not the same thing. No, you know? and I, well, and here I'm doing this stuff that's seen worldwide and all that. You know, not that I'm on a high horse, but they think that yeah, my, their advice to me is I should draw somebody's dog. You know. <laughs> it's sometimes the equivalent like like working in the metal world where it's like you know we largely do illustrative uh paintings but i'm sure you guys have gotten plenty of people like hey could you do a logo for me yeah oh, like, dude. i'm not a graphic designer yeah. like, or, or i i partly am and i've done it but i've uh, yeah and i've done a couple but nowadays i'm just like i know logo logo guys do Go with them. They know yes. what they're doing. They like doing this. I, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Well, but I've had people on that exact same wavelength that you're talking about come up to me and they're, they're talking about the work and they're liking it. And they go, what would you charge me if I had you do a Cubs logo? <laughs> uh, <laughs> do a tattoo for me? A Cubs yeah. logo, which is a giant letter C. Yeah. Yeah. Which you can go get a sticker of any size. Yeah. You know, you can just go do that. I used to work right. And they look right at you too. Like, you know. I used to work with a guy who wanted me and he asked me several times over the span of like a year if I would do a Red Wings <laughs> logo for him, but for a tattoo, he wanted a Red Wings logo with tribal around it. Oh boy. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I, it, that's not what I, I do. I wouldn't do that anyway. And second of all, I, that's not what I do. And he just, uh, just couldn't get it. And, but yeah. yeah, 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 you're right. They, they don't get it. Mm -mm. And and I, I try to be so I nice. And polite. <laughs> I, I don't want to be one of those arrogant artists because we've all met them, and I, I I just refuse. And I don't want to ever come off accidentally as seeming arrogant. You know? Yeah, it's just it's just not what you do, and like you have to let people know that. Yeah. <laughs> like, a lot of people show me a picture of their daughter and make me feel bad. You know, well she's got cancer and all that, and I'd really like you to do a portrait of her. Could you do it today? <laughs> From this photograph, and you're like you don't want me to do that. Yeah, yeah. and I said, well, I you have to actually leave town today. So I, no, I can't. Because <laughs> you know we're we're traveling around doing these art exhibits. They're not in my local town or anything. There's hardly there's not really a big art scene there. So uh, it's yeah. funny. I'm just I'm just imagining the equivalent of like the uh, the Mona Lisa thing you described. Like somebody listening to Slime Lord. <laughs> and being like, oh, this is like Beethoven. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> just, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah. like Beethoven, only totally different. <laughs> <laughs> it is music, yes. Right, yeah. Well, you know, my, my, my dad, rest his soul, he didn't know the difference between a Chinese culture, Japanese culture, Filipino mm -hmm. culture. It's all the same because they're Asian. Now, he's not, he's not racist. He just thought that it was the same. They all live in the same world, and they all somehow know each other, you know. Because he, he grew up in a little small coal mining town, and that's what he was taught. And yeah, he's never met anybody from. So I, when I was in art school, I had a Japanese roommate, and my dad was so. You would have thought that this guy had come from Mars. My dad just didn't know how to take it. He didn't know. How, he just couldn't understand it. He, I'm not kidding. It's, you. It was just it's innocent black. ignorance, you know. 
Like, well, just yeah, you know, my dad. He's just he's just from a small place. Never ventured far, you know. And that's that's just it. He was a coal miner. Just he just didn't you know didn't go on. And of course, it sounds like I'm putting down small towns and coal mines. I'm not doing that. But it was just so it was so unreal to my dad that I not only knew but had in in the apartment we were renting a Japanese roommate from another part of the world. He just was like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, we, we've really gotten off the, the subject. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> you're, you're hitting close to home, too, because I'm actually doing some logo work right now, and it's not my specialty. There you go. And I, I <laughs> do have a history of doing dog portraits. So, yeah, well, I start, <laughs> both of those it things. Hap- I feel like you're not a real artist until you've had a family member <laughs> ask for a dog portrait and yeah. a picture oh, yeah. of their kid, of the kid, the grandkids. And I've yeah. done it, I have, but it was way yeah. back then. Yeah, yeah. Back then when I was working at the newspaper in Harrisburg, Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So again, now you can see the process and then as it's shaping up, neither of these pictures, you know, show anything completely finished, but um, you see now it's, I just decided to follow the happy accident that happened and, and delineate all this in blue first. What you don't see is then I washed over it again with uh, the brown and green mixture that I've been using throughout the entire thing. It gives a yellowish cast to it when it's dry. Um, just unfortunately, I just don't have a shot of that there. But you see that, again, everything is worked out, and almost all the details are worked out right then and there. There's not that much added to it, uh, except for when I improvise on a texture, because I just know that's going to be a texture, and I'm just going to do that as, as I go. But um, again, I hope that it, it answers the question because so many, I mean, it just endlessly people say, so with all this detail, you just kind of freewheel this, you just make this up as you're going along. And it's it's on, honestly not true. No, there are things that are put in when a notion strikes me or things that are taken out when I realize it won't work. That's just an editing process that happens to anybody. Um, one thing is, though, look at the blue line picture on the left and you see that the, the lines for the bell shape, if you can make it out there are very haphazard. I just threw it in there so I can get started. And then talking about perspective earlier with J- uh, with Jesse, I worked out all the lines that you see going around the bell on the more finished picture on the right. And you'll see that they are all technically correct and in the right order. I knew where they would go beforehand. I just hurried up and put that in there so I could send a pro- progress picture to the band and, and uh, to 20 bucks spin just to show them here's how far I, how long I am, you know, Send the check, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, and they say, see, and I would say, see, notice that I've included the bell. Notice I've included blah, blah blah. All the things we had discussed. Notice that it's all in here. There's even a living cauldron. Um, if you're if we're still looking on the left, you'll see a kind of a an odd amphibious looking creature. And he's there's a bone sticking out of this little object that has spider legs at the bottom. It's actually a living cauldron that walks around. And as he stirs up whatever material it is they're going to feast on he stirs it up in that and it digests it through this is all in the album digests it through this creature and it's all excreted through these vaginal openings and dropped down into the water well the liquid let's say that's flowing like a stream through this landscape which is the very bottom of the picture and that's all in there now these are all concepts that you'll find as you're listening to the record and reading the reading the lyrics and just and, and you know investing in this world and then notice that I didn't put the textures on the raw, on the, look at the ground, you know, in the blue area. Uh, I didn't put the textures in there because I just, I do just improvise the textures as I go. I already know in my head what they're going to be. And I just, I just go for it there. I don't, I don't sit there and draw it all out so that they can say yes or no. I just tell them that's going to be a rough rock wall and leave it. And then I make it a rough rock wall as I go. That, uh, that cauldron creature is is very fucked up. I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, I love a cauldron vagina. It's one of my favorite kinds. I can't get enough. It's a very cool thing. Need one for home and one in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm happy with the if we go now to the right, I'm really happy with the nasty colors of rot that I got in there that aren't that aren't so repugnant you don't want to look at it. It's it's colors you find in nature. But people will look at that, and they don't see that as colors they find in nature. They see that as colors that are something horrifying. And, that, of course, that's what it's meant to be. But when I point out to people, they go, oh, my gosh, just all this violence. I said, well, number one, there's not a bit of violence in this picture. Yeah, no. you're, you're imagining no. it because there's a great deal of energy happening with all this moving uh, framework. But um, the colors are reflective of what you'd find if you go for a walk in a, in a rainy fall 
afternoon, you'd see those mossy greens and those those kind of browns and things like that, especially when they're wet. Okay. And, and you'd see a lot of like you know mulch on the ground where the where um, where wood is rotted and plants and leaves have rotted and turned they're turned into mush and all that stuff. And no one finds that offensive. No one finds that horrifying. But you you take those elements and put it in a picture with the context that this is a, a, a scene of horror. Yeah. yeah it just turns their, their brain short circuits. Yeah. And I think we want to do as death metal artists. That's exactly yeah. one of our goals. You know, yeah, I, I, I like what you're saying too, about how there, there is no violence in here because, because there's not, it's just, um, you know, in overabundance of life spewing out of itself endlessly. And like that, that alone is repulsive to a human, you know, and it's okay. repulsive because it's, chaotic and uh yeah everything is just spewing forth some new horrible thing that um you, there's nothing in your, for your mind to latch on to and i think that's where that repulsion and horror comes from but the the colors uh you know like you say are not you know that that rocky patch really uh sort of looks like a bunch of mushrooms and like moss to me and there's rotted flesh there's big piles of rotted flesh there sure yeah and up above in the upper, let's let's go. Let's be on the right hand uh, image. Um, up up above at the top, you see what almost looks like a rib cage. It's not quite, but it almost it recalls that. And it looks like bodily organs hanging down. Yeah. There's nothing in that that's a human organism at all. But it re, it's it reflects that. It recalls that in your mind so that you can relate to it. Those are organs hanging down out of a creature. We we don't even know what this creature looks like on the outside. We're on the inside. And so if you'll notice now, I put a great deal of rot in those colors up above, but I used attractive colors. It's like pale color, pale browns and pale magentas. They don't really show as magenta because I've mixed them with other, other colors and things. But if you look at it, it starts to get nastier and nastier, but at first it's done in attractive colors. You know, you see the blues and the purples and things and your eye goes there because I wanted your eye to go. And there's too much stuff. And I've done this in the past a couple of times. I've got a, too much of a knot of stuff somewhere and they miss certain things that I hope people would see. So when I have a big knot of that stuff now, I put attractive colors in there. Like you'll see those turquoises and purples working yeah. with each other. There's some magentas working with the turquoises and stuff. And your eye goes there and look at the pleasing shapes. And then you start to realize, take it, take it apart for what it is and start to see that there's just slushy nastiness in it. And because it would, that's what would be on the inside of a creature. The only thing that's entirely total fantasy about all this is the fact that it would not be this brightly lit and we don't know what the light source would be if you're inside a giant creature and if you're thinking that hard <laughs> then you you know you're you're in the wrong arena exactly if, yeah. if it was as dark as it really would be you wouldn't see all this good stuff no so so i always tell them i said there's a suspension of disbelief just like in the movies how come indiana jones never gets a bullet you know <laughs> he never takes a bullet yeah <laughs> all these you know th ten thousand shots him and jason statham they never get shot or when they do get shot it's a little big pin prick right here they can pick it out and they go right on fighting that's a suspension of disbelief and that's what happens in this kind of stuff too so you know when i think about the lighting on this i just decided the light comes from the right Shadows are on, or excuse me, the light comes from the left, shadows are on the right, and that, that's all it's going to be throughout the whole thing, and I'm not going to explain where the light comes from, because even I don't know. I just decided that would be the light source and keep it simple. As long as you have a source, it doesn't matter. That's right. Yeah, and that's true. I tell people it won't matter. Yeah, as long as it's consistent. When you, when you were talking about uh, perspective, you can have the vanishing point way off the picture. Oh yeah, because I'll have paper spread out and have a vanishing point way off the end of the of the illustration board, and and fix a big long T square to it and just move it around and get it like that. And people go, I, I where did you put the vanishing point? It looks like it didn't go anywhere. And I said yes. way off, way off the side of the paper. Yeah, the, for that piece I did, they were each like, that's the whole point of the cardboard is that the VPs are like yeah two feet off to the side of either end. So, but yeah, the consistency is all that matters. Yeah, same with the light. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, it, it. It basically reminds me of this like quote that I remember Peter Jackson having uh, while making Lord of the Rings. I think it's for like the Helm's Deep sequence, and somebody was asking him like, "Oh, this is a nighttime. Like, where's that big spotlight coming from? It's not from the moon or anything." And he was like, the "Same place where the music is coming from." <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, you need to see what's going on. <laughs> you're not thinking like oh is there a literal orchestra there with all the orcs on the battlefield no 
it's, yeah, no, but that that light with some, some fog throwing some mist, it's gonna look sick. <laughs> it's gonna look great. You're gonna be able to see everything. Doesn't matter. That's all you need. <laughs> That's killer. You just, well, you know, in, in the original Blazing Saddles, uh, the sheriff is he gets on his horse and he's got his new gun belt and all that, and you hear the 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 swelling music, and as he rides along, he rides right past an orchestra that's playing yeah. all <laughs> 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 it's like, don't don't worry about it. It just sets the stage. Yeah, That's all yeah. you need. It's an artificial reality. You just got to understand that. I know, but I meet a lot of people who are literal minded and and they they want to make sense of it all yeah. because they're str I know that they're looking at it and struggling because it's it's a reality they've never pondered before. They don't look That's at the it. Point. Like that. Yeah. All right. So here's our here's our finished picture. And you know, we were talking about Jesse. You said you had a photo guy. Uh, in the next town over from me, and you see the picture on the left, I have a guy who sc photos and scans all my pieces. Mm -hmm. Now, the original is not that big, guys. I've had a lot of people. The original is in that cardboard down below. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I wow. hope, I hope that doesn't nice. disappoint anybody. But that cardboard is about tw 28 inches or something like that. It's about, that's about how big it was. Okay. Um, and but that this is Danny at French's studio, and he, he takes photographs of the artwork, and then he scans in the photograph, and and uh, you can't tell; it never looks second generation. It just doesn't. And um, that screen, just in this photograph, it makes it look ultra bright. It's the true colors are, are reflected in the one on the right. It's not really that bright, um, but it just looks. I don't know. This photo just makes it look like that. When you stand at a certain place in the room, it, the colors seem to adjust correctly. But um, that's where I get it scanned. I, and I, I put this picture on my threads page. And I had some people who asked me if that was at 20 bucks spin. It's like, is that where they do it? <laughs> and, you know, and I could have spun some really good story out of it, but I'm painfully honest. And I said, no, not at all. I said, I've never even, never even walked into 20 bucks spin. I've never had to go there. I'm a freelancer. So, yeah, yeah that, I think most of us will often sometimes never even meet clients just because yeah. they live in anyone. Com <laughs> never met anyone. <laughs> I so like when anybody comes to Vegas, like I gotta go to the show. I gotta go say hi, uh, because like otherwise, I'm just never gonna meet these people. Um, so especially with record labels, very rarely run into anybody. Yeah. So anyway, that's Slime Lord Kytridio. I say, how do you say it? Kytridiomycosis relinquished. And Kytridiomycosis is a plague that hits amphibious creatures. It's a lethal fungus. So when he said lethal, they could have called the album Lethal Fungus, and I would have still come up with this cover. <laughs> because, well, someone said it was chlamydia relinquished, and I said, that would have been perfect. That would have happened. <laughs> we, we vet for the gore grind bands. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Or, or just yeah. what it was. Just, That's just, a different just, cover. exactly what it is. You know? <laughs> it, all of that would have worked. I said, all those are terrific ideas, you guys. You know, They all are. Um, but there it is. So you know, I hope I answered any questions that needed to be answered. Totally, man. And, and there's a couple more slides of some other recent work, just so people can see. We'll go through pretty quick. Yeah, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do it quickly. This one was from last year, and I'm very proud of it. This was Sedimentum, a French-Canadian band, and oh, on Misaku and Ojo Records. I'm probably saying that wrong, in London, England. And this one also had a hell of a concept behind it. It takes a while to see everything in it again, a very sulfury sky, because it's the end of the world. In fact, it's a couple thousand years after mankind has been wiped off the planet and vegetation that has re-sprouted is desperately trying to grow flesh instead of grow to start mankind again, rather than growing ve more vegetation. So if you look closely now on the right hand side, which is the front of the album, you'll see a female shaped plant creature. And if you really look closely, it's giving birth in the vaginal area to a, to a corpse. That's coming straight on out. Yep. It's just as if it's made a full size corpse. And then there's all kinds of just just decadent flora and fauna all over the thing and melted structures from like the atomic war that happened or, or whatever happened into it. Uh, technically, when I did this one, just as far as a technical achievement, every now and then you do a piece that is 100% the way you wanted it to come out. It's rare. This one's one of them. Uh, there's not a single part that I say, oh, I fudged it here or this isn't exactly what I saw. This one, the, the colors mixed. I saw it in my head, and the colors mixed on the first time, just the way I wanted it to. The reflection in that nasty water down below. Uh, just every every part of it came out exactly what I wanted it to do. And I was looking at a lot of surreal. I love the uh, 1920s, 1930s surrealist painters. 
and I was just going back through, and every time I want to recharge my batteries, I look through their stuff. Because their stuff is just unfettered, yeah. and it didn't follow any any commercial pattern, you know. And I thought I gotta I gotta remain unfettered. I gotta not be swayed by the commercial stuff. So this painting, of course, has zero commercial. You'll never see this in Walmart, you know. But um, <laughs> it's one of the ones I'm really, really, really super proudest of. And not a not enough people I feel like have seen it. Yeah, I don't think I've seen this one, but I I can see the um the early surrealism, of course, and I'm reminded a little bit of uh, uh, Joffre Bouchard. I don't know. How oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just in that sort of gnarled, endless, tripped out landscape sort of thing. But um, the thing that I think is most successful in this overall is uh, just how diseased it feels. Yes, <laughs> the, the landscape itself is just hopelessly poisoned. It seems like, and it's it's because of these. Uh, these grotesque color choices like this uh spewing yellowish uh reminds me of like a volcano or geyser yeah in the Soft. background it's, yeah exactly it's it's i i would never think of using those colors but yeah they diseased is the word that i think of when i look at this uh, that's exactly what i was going for just yeah. absolute hope there's still life flourishing in an absolutely hopeless environment right right yeah it's nightmarish well, and you ought to hear the album, man. I think I remember listening to this record. Oh, like, like I, 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 I think I remember digging it. It, it isn't like the the band logo is in like kind of a gray in the, in the top left of, of the front. I think, if I remember right, uh, yeah, yeah. Like I, 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 I'm now remembering this this record. Like, yeah. and, and from what I remember, it sounding like this matches it very well. Yeah, the, it's got another unpronounceable title it's superation morphogenesequa <laughs> yeah and and I'm, sure I'm, sure, I, I'm from illinois i'm sure i say everything wrong so you know i'm sure i'm sure i'm saying it wrong but uh, I, I i hope these guys choose me to do i, I hope that their, their follow-up to this is an as an equally powerful concept and number two i hope they choose me again because I, I love the back and forth working with these guys was just one of those invigorating things I couldn't wait. I was working on some other th projects too at that time, which is the usual case. And I couldn't wait to the part of the day to get all that set aside and get to work on this and start texting those guys, the pictures. And I, I just couldn't wait to get to it. It was just one of those joyous occasions. You know, and yeah, it's, it's a good one. And it's, it's one of my absolute favorite paintings that I think I've ever done. It's awesome, man. You're on a tear. And this one was last year's coffin mulch. And I, this one was shoehorned in. I'm not kidding you. There was no time. I even told them, I said, I'm afraid you'll have to, to get someone else. I can't get it done on your deadline. And I got it done on the deadline. I wouldn't have thought so. I would never have thought so. But it's a, it's from the album Spectral Intercession, Coffin Mulch, Spectral Intercession. And um, at war with False Noise Records and Dry Cough Records together. <clears throat> and you'll see if you read it from left to right, uh, there's coffins, there's the green stuff coming in that that signifies death against all the twilight purples and things and all the art deco stuff going on in there and it's the whole world coming apart and then there's just one little skeleton it takes a little minute to find him in there and uh, he's being pulled towards the right hand side and then you'll see there's the pearly gates up above and i didn't want to do the the the, the cliche hell there's just the graves if you've noticed are on the bottom half down below and, uh, and of course, there's a skull thing on on a dead tree and all that. All that you know works to, to sell the idea. Of what happens to the soul one eye blink after death? And uh, uh, Alistair is the leader of this band. And he goes, I really want to do something that doesn't have the cliches. I don't want the demon with a pitchfork. I don't want the upside down crosses. I don't want any of that cliche, cliche, cliche stuff. And I said, Oh, I'm I'm with you. I don't want to do any of that either. And he says, So so how do we do this? And I said, We got to go with. Uh, I said an almost psychedelic uh, approach because a lot of people see the passage of the soul as a, as a psychedelic experience because it's going to be outside the physical realm. You're entering the metaphysical realm. And I said, but he says, but don't, I don't want to show the metaphysical realm. I just want to show one eye blink after death. What do you think? And I said, well, it's going to be a disintegration. Everything is going to be, here's, here's the world, here's the coffin, here's the funeral and the total disintegration completely away from that. And his idea was let's go from grungy colors on the left to really, really bright tonalities on the right. He goes, go for neon orange and pink and all that, but can, can you make it work? And that's a challenge, but I, I think it works. I'm actually proud of that. And there are some really, really saturated oranges in that, that uh, a lot of death metal guys would be like, ooh, that's, that's wrong. You know, it shouldn't be bright. It shouldn't be energetic like that. 
but it's what he wanted. And I saw it in my head again as I, I, I can do this. I, I can make this work. I think I can, uh, yeah. I, I can see in my head how it mix it to make it to make it come apart, come across as correct. You know? Overall, I'd say it's actually pretty complimentary, especially if you kind of just blur your eyes a little bit. Um, it, it works going from left to right, I think. Um, and it's not easy to do to, <laughs> it's not easy to work in those super saturated, bright no. colors with the mucky, nasty, slimy shit. But I, I do think you pulled it off here for sure. Oh, it goes to it goes to show it's all context, you know. Yeah, like you can you can use those colors just in in the proper context. You yeah, know? We'll not, figure it out. <laughs> not not every you know fantastical black metal album needs to ha be a spooky blue castle. Uh, you can I, use I've a, done one. Yeah, you, you can you can <laughs> yeah. do other colors than that. It just has to be in the in the right uh context mm -hmm. uh and uh like with something like this like especially if you're going for psychedelia and not traditional like especially religious uh depictions of heaven or hell um this is the right way to go because it's yeah. completely otherworldly so why stick to like you know standard angels and demons yes uh, yeah heaven is golden blue a hell is red and black, like sort of stuff. Why yeah. not get nuts with it? Yeah. See, that's, that's what I wanted to do because no, you know, we, as far as we know, nobody's gone to either of those places and come back with a, with a correct <laughs> description. So, um, yeah, that's, you know, that, that's why how I wanted to look. I just wanted to, be, this is all one eye blink, just one half of a second, 10th of a second of the change from, living to dead but i didn't want to show a man going <gasps> and a spirit coming out because right. i was working on a, i'm working on the cover for um funerary uh outlook at the same time i was working on this and we do have a, a a character who's being tortured by a kind of a cyclops warlock looking guy and we do have the soul being wrenched out of the body on that one and i thought well I, gosh i can't turn right around and do that on this too so yeah. You know, how are we going to do this? And so discussions back and forth that led to this. Because at first he said, do you like the artist that does the cathedral album covers? I said, oh, oh yeah, he, he's awesome. And he goes, well, he goes, can you do something like that, but not copy? We don't want it to look like a cathedral album, but I want it to be real busy and real, real uh, just attacking your senses. And I said, yeah, you came to the right guy. I, I paint very busy pictures. So, yeah, th there's that part. But then it turned into this, and the only figure in it, there is a rotted corpse creature on the far left with one hand over its chest like this, if you look mm -hmm. closely, laying in a very fantastical kind of co coffin, right before the real coffins there on the steps. And then there's a, there's a partial skeleton. And other than that, it's all completely envisioned forms. You know, Now, some people call this abstract. It really isn't abstract. If you look, there's forms all through it. Abstraction yeah. is formless. It's more surreal. It's, than yeah, and see, and I, I consider I do I consider myself a surrealist. I really do. I tell people that if you want to look for, I, I'm not. I don't really consider myself a fantasy artist. Not, not really. I said I'm much, much, much more of a surrealist. But working in the modern text, you know, context today, and uh, and I, you know, I'm lucky to be able to do it for a living for record companies and for book covers and stuff. It just, it, it you know, the right thing at the right time, I suppose. But um, it, and and I've had many people who said, well, it's kind of a an abstracted idea of death. Well, gosh, death and the, the transition of the soul is an abstract idea because, again, you're leaving the physical and going into the metaphysical. What does the metaphysical look like? Well, it's wide open, you know, so you can interpret it a billion ways. And that's why I told him, I said, if we do the color switch, it's got to go from the drab, uh, morbid colors right into psychedelia. It's got to. I said, but not psychedelia with blooming sunflowers and you know, rainbows and porpoises, you know, there's that kind of psychedelia. No, no, not that stuff, you know. And, uh, and of course he was immediately going, Oh yeah. You know, uh, that's, that's what I meant too. So again, and this one was another truly successful, true collaboration. We were back and forth with our texts and things. And, and it was just, it was just fitting right into place. And I was really glad that I was able to shoehorn it in at Christmas time last oh. year. Yeah. So and I told him, I said, I can't make it. I said, if you could, if you could any way schedule it in the new year, you know, and uh, he couldn't do it. So I finished it in Christmas time last year. Yeah. Oh, but there it is. And a lot of people have liked it. My, my print version of this that I sell at shows and sell online that just steadily sales on this one. People really like this image. Nice. I mean, props on it being last minute because it, it looks very 
consistent with the rest of your work. Like you. it shows that you've got a certain amount of quality control. Uh, it, it, it is unfortunate that it also tells you like, ah, oh, shit. Like if, if somebody does need something last minute, I can do it. Do I want to, Yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Do I he need kept, to? He kept with me going, you're, he goes, you're the one that we've, we've discussed and discussed. And it was really, you know, really, really appealing to me. The fact that they really, really liked my work. I thought, wow, I don't, don't want to let these guys down. And, yeah. and, I, and plus I heard their music. It was like, oh yes, I want to do these guys. I want to do their, their album, the music is just a friggin' blowtorch of a record. It is. And it's got D beats, you know, instead of blast beats. And it's real catchy without being, you know, popish or anything like that. When I say catchy, I mean, you can get behind it. You can actually right. you know, go along with it. You know, and a lot of times with blast beats, you're, you're going, well, this is the third blast beat in this song. You know, are they on a different chord? You know, sometimes, sometimes you don't know. And with these guys, they really craft a song. It's not just 10 titles on the record. It's 10 different songs. You know, and they're uh, they're they're a band to watch. I, I mean, they, and this album sold fairly well. Um, the distribution is still going on. They're still getting out, getting it out to bigger, bigger and bigger places. Uh, so I, I have high hopes for these guys. But coffin mulch, spectral intercession. Sick. For the sake of time, can we get to James's work? Is that cool? Oh, we need to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I took up too much space. Oh no, uh, it's all got, right. Man. I mean, dude, you got. Very interesting stories, and people love to hear them, so I'm right here with you. But just quickly, so people can just look at it. Really cool. Piece oh, yeah, there. that was this was a, 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 a hardcore punk and doom mix. Okay. It's four different bands on Totem Cat Records in France, and it's a, a dope smoking fossil. There you go. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> hey, check that out. That's awesome. <laughs> well, yeah, check it out, man. All those descriptors. <laughs> on k -Tel Records and Tapes. <laughs> All right, James. All righty. So I, I, this is basically um, for the, uh, I guess, now revealed uh, gatefold artwork I've done for the new Carrie King record. Um, the main thing we went over that I, I had going into this was the, you know, it's new Carrie King record. So, you know, it's coming after Slayer and everything. Very similar vibes, uh, and the album title was From Hell I Rise. So I took it as like, okay, so I'm, I'm it, there were a couple different names for, for the band uh, leading up to this. So it, it, it wasn't until like last minute that it was just like, okay, we're just going with Kerry King. Um, but I think like one was King's Reign. Uh, so I was just taking it as like a some sort of kingly type character uh some someone with status someone with power uh who's coming back after a long like sleep or something it's it's very it's kind of meta in you know the since slayer i think disbanded 2018 2019 something like that yeah and this kind of being like carrie's first big project out of the gate uh since it's been revealed that slayer is back uh, yeah. <laughs> they're going to be playing right. a couple of shows. So that that's also a surprise to me. Um, but this was very much like thematically trying to go down the road of like, okay, some, a powerful figure is coming back uh, after being asleep uh, and definitely, you know, coming back from a sort of like religious uh, depiction of hell, uh, which is very much in, in line with a lot of like Slayer's past like in, in entire discography in terms of themes. Um, so this was the initial, I, I sent them a, a, a bunch of sketches trying to get out an idea, but this is the initial one that actually like stuck the most, which was like some sort of old kingly figure coming out um, of, you know, not necessarily hell, but coming out of like some sort of fiery domain and looking on towards uh, the horizon and then the we, the details of like what he'd be looking at, what is in the horizon, and all that can be figured out later. It's I like to get like the big chunks, baseline ideas out early, so that like if they respond to this, then I know that okay, we can at least start ironing stuff out, uh, and and really um, starting add, adding some uh, details and more context uh, as we go on. Um, so we started out with this and this was just like done on my iPad and procreate um, and mainly trying to establish like an overall vibe, a color scheme, 
uh, you know, very dark, bleak, but with splashes of uh, the reds and yellows of the the lava, uh, and then it lighting up the character from underneath, and then showing some um, symbols of status uh, with his uh, crown. Uh, he's got like rings and, and and wristbands, and then of course the upside down cross uh, uh, necklace. Uh, so all stuff to kind of basically signify Carrie King and his uh, uh, status um, as, as you know, like a metal legend without just literally painting him. There's no tribal tattoos. On no, no <laughs> tribal tattoos. Um, but yeah, we started out with this. And, and sometimes that, like this is just like just to get an idea out and a vibe out. Um I think uh, I think you captured some John Martin energy in this one. Yeah, that's it. That's um, absolutely yes. what what yeah. I wanted to channel because okay. his his stuff is so much about like big landscapes with like hellish stuff happening to mountainsides, big crowds, big yep. expressive cloud work. Nobody did it like that guy. If no, uh, so he's concerned. <laughs> anyway. th this is a case where, like, I I feel like you you guys all have a very like noticeable set style that I can immediately recognize. Whereas, like with with my stuff, I like to be almost like um, uh, almost like a I don't know. Uh, I'm, I think the the closest thing I can relate to is like maybe a film director. Where like, I don't know. You think of like Spielberg, like he's directed super, you know, serious dramas, war movies, but then he's also made Hook. You know, like it's <laughs> it's something where like you can take those skills and use it towards like different things that work for different genres and everything. So this was very much, you know, I'm not approaching it the same way I would like municipal waste cover, which is very playful, yeah. bright, yeah. cartoony. This needs to have a certain seriousness about it, um, yeah, and that's yeah. something something Carrie established early on. It's like don't want it to be cartoony. I want it to be, you know, serious, straight faced. It has, um, a, it has a gravity to it. It's good. You, yeah, you, it, it, it yeah. needs to have gravity to it. Um, but yeah, th this is where we started, and then I think if you go to the next sketch, you'll see like how we started developing the idea. Whereas um, the first sketch, which I think it, like works as a, a cool sketch, I still really like the image. I think it's got a lot of emotional weight to it. But the problem was that the figure looked kind of like weak. It needed to be shown to have like a sort of power that it that it need, needed to be like all encompassing and just just show that it it's it was ready to take on the world. It was intimidating. More um, human features too, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was way more human. It looked more like an old man. Um, whereas we, I, I decided like, okay, so it needs to be more intimidating. It needs to take up more of the picture too, because I had a lot of like just sky beforehand. And with this, I, uh, the idea was like, okay, I'll put a crown on him. Um, but maybe what if the crown within it had like different shapes and structures within it to where it almost looked like a, a city a city like, yeah like, like he was church. Like, yeah. yeah like 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 he was carrying like the church of hell on on his head and like a, wall, a walled city in europe on top of his head like he's that he's that huge yes it, it, it needed to show a certain amount of scale uh and then like in the foreground i've got like this is where it's just you're taking just little scribbles and implying a lot with them. Like in the foreground, just like got these little like stick, like black streaks. And there I, I would tell uh, the label and carry just like, okay, in the foreground, I'm going to have a bunch of guys just like marching on. I'm going to have like uh, some sort of hellish army that he's let loose from, from him uh, coming out of the earth. And then I'll have them, slowly marching on into the horizon into the light uh or in, into that sort of sunset looking thing and the other part like I, I needed to find a way to like get some more motion into the uh into the piece so i decided like okay i'm gonna give him a cloak or cape that's made up of like clouds and stuff and have that spill into the sky 
and coming out of it, it's just a, a tons a, a different like creatures and bats and and different different bits of his army that he brings with him. Almost like the, he's this huge toxic force uh, that just bleeds off his armies, uh, infects everything he gets into. Um, so that that was a good way to like to fill up the space, but with stuff that actually like had a purpose instead of it just being clouds. Uh, it's it's as if he's affecting the whole environment around him, and then having his his arm like scrape the earth open mm -hmm. into the foreground helped me also add a little bit of scale and perspective too to show him going his body going farther back into the piece and his hand coming up uh, closer into it, uh, and it's just a fun way for him to interact with the environment other than just kind of like standing there. Uh, yeah. with his torso poking out. The scratches are clever. I, I, I like this composition overall. I think uh, I like, too, that you, you kept some of that negative space from the sketch. Um, I think it's all very thoughtfully considered. It's good. Thanks. Uh, it was it's definitely an example of, of I know this is going to have a lot of detail in it. Yeah. So I need to make sure that the various structures in it are clear and the negative space needs to be the negative space rather than just it's hard filling, to do. filling up everything. Yeah. Um, like it'll still all be detailed by the end of it. Uh, but the main focus needs to be uh, him. And then all the other stuff happening around him is more decorative or just a way of adding like good, like motion to the piece so that like everything flows well, it leads your eye and, and helps tell the story. Yeah. Do you find that when you're at this stage, like, cause you, you have everything like mapped out. Is it kind of like a, a sigh of relief, you know, when they're like, okay, approved because now it's just the details and just kind of the fun part. Like they're not going to have as many uh, theoretically, like as many qualms like down the road, because this looks very close to the final, but it's really cool as we'll go through this deck, like each stage really does lift it and elevate it even more. You know, it's it's I mean, it's always the sigh of relief when they're like, OK, that's good. Go with that. Yeah, uh, because you're no longer in the stage of like, eh, you know, <laughs> they're, they're being wishy washy on, on certain concepts. Um, we did like there were two other versions of this, I th I think, where it's still this sort of composition. But one had him like um, standing to where like it cut off maybe just below his knees and he was like pointing towards the horizon and. I liked how that looked, but um, I think this just filled up the space a little bit more. Right. Because uh, I, I, I didn't... It, it was a case where we were trying to make sure everything felt powerful. Um, and just him being, you know, coming out with just his torso added a, maybe a little bit more... Um, uh, tension in the piece rather than him just kind of like standing there out of the lava. Uh, so you, so you can almost like imagine the process that will happen uh, of, of him coming out and, and moving forward into the horizon. Um, but yeah, like this, this is a stage where like they're, they're like, okay, do that. Then I can do my favorite part, which is basically make, do, make it look sexy after that. You yeah, know, do, yeah. do all the fun stuff because uh, your structure is there. Now it's just about ironing out everything and making it look the best it possibly can. Yeah, and then, then we get to this stage. And this is like a case where like that, that version of the image is like, it, it's almost it's nearly 90% of the work right here. Uh, there's still way more detail I have to put in. There's so many more monsters that I have to flesh out after this point. Uh, because a lot of the figures in the front, like there, there's definitely a lot more definition to them now, but they're really just little black blobs. And I, I guess the, the kind of corner I painted myself into a, as an artist uh, who needs to like, live up to my past work is that like I, I need to make sure a, a lot of different parts of this painting are, are pretty well uh 
ironed out in terms of detail. Uh, so everything needs to be a lot more rendered. You know, if his face is going to look like that, if his arm is going to look like that in terms of rendering, then I got to try to match everything else. Uh, so that that is the problem when it comes to any sort of a crowd scene where you're just like, ah, oh, crap, I've got to... <laughs> I've got to make these things like actually I, I, I got to differentiate them a, a little bit and add some more detail. Um, but I have noticed from, from looking at other artists work, especially up close, especially, especially of, of crowd scenes, there's so much you can do with just implications where in the foreground, you can have them like nice and uh, detailed and everything. But um, once they go farther back into the, uh, into the landscape, you can do a lot with just a couple paint strokes that will say that's his head, that's mm-hmm. his side, that's a sword, and then you're done. You don't need to go farther than that. Uh, otherwise, you're just doing way too much work for yourself. Yeah, it's actually I think probably would be worse if you <laughs> you don't want to render those things that are fading off into the distance because mm-hmm. that just makes it confusing. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it because if. Yeah, it, it it starts to not make sense and then flattens things out if exactly. uh, everything is within the same amount of like clarity and sharpness. Yeah. yeah, I struggle with finding that balance like in everything I do as well. So I, I definitely understand that. I think you did a good job here, though. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Uh, I think part of it too is is figuring out what they the client likes to, cause it's some of this, like I look at the art at this point, and I really like it, but I can see like, Oh, it's a little dark. I could uh, up the contrast a little bit. There's, there's areas, especially like uh, to the top left area where it's really just smudgy smoke with the bare implications yeah. of figures and stuff that I need to iron out. I love your colors though. They're, they're, they're really great in this. Yeah. They're Netherlandish. They look like odd near drum and his oil paintings are a little heavy and right. Metaf- metaphysically dense. Thanks. Yeah. That is, this was a case of like, I knew my, I, it, it was, it's definitely playing into like past Slayer covers and stuff. Like I, I look at stuff like rain and blood and South of heaven, all that sort of stuff. And it's, it's a lot of like, <clears throat> deep blacks and reds and some yellow accents, but it, it all looks very like, like sickly and smoky and, you know, hellish. And I, I wanted to try to match that while still not just being that like this, this has to be a, a, a big uh, epic landscape with a certain sense of scale. Yeah. Um, so I, I think figuring out, especially with, with clouds and smoke and everything, it's it's very easy to get kind of muddy and confusing with them. So it is yeah. that case of like you you do need to have like certain amount of structures. Like there's this cloud, this cloud, this cloud, this one's this one big shape, and then I can add the details later. But you need like big shape, big shape, big shape. So you're not just it's not just a mess up there. It needs to have like a especially with with this character like it, it needed to have a flow and purpose to its direction. Um, cause ultimately this piece is also a, a, um, full landscape piece for a gay fold, gatefold. So this is just like the right half of it. Okay. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff happening on the left side that I'll, will be revealed when the record comes out, but it all like helps inform what's going on over here. It's so cool, man. And the, uh, I don't, I don't remember the term for it, but you guys have seen that compositional drawing of like the Fibonacci kind of nautical yeah. shell looking thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you really truly have that composition with the swirling of the cloud cape um, kind of thing. And, and, and like everything just kind of supports that motion. So I love how there's no stiffness at all in this beautiful. It's, it's funny. Like I, I think there is something that I've, if I try to glamour onto like, okay, what's, what's my style? Like it's hard for me to immediately describe that. But I do tend to really like very flowy, mm-hmm. uh, smoky, fiery elements that all kind of uh, weave their way into the overall visual uh, flow and shape of, of events within the piece. So I, did, I tend to have a whole lot of clouds and fiery, smoky elements in, in my pieces. So that 
I mean, it's the stuff that probably comes easiest to me, so I just naturally like gravitate to that. It's not even like a planned out thing. Um, and sometimes clients just ask you to paint very similar things, so you end up doing them a lot. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's fun for me. Uh, I'd I'd rather paint, uh, you know, spooky looking clouds over like, you know, something that I'm not so experienced at like you know paint me a hot rod car <laughs> yeah not happening buddy sorry yeah i just like i i'll try but i man I'd, I'd have to figure out a whole lot before i even tackle something like that <laughs> i know what you mean so before you before you turn it in can you put an alternate universe in the top corner thanks so much yeah <laughs> oh sure no problem yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah i'll do it over the weekend yeah or tonight yeah <laughs> i need it now yeah just for the sake of it, I'm going to go here, then here, and then here, just so people can kind of see the full thing. Yeah. Right. And, it, it, and this is, this is where like, you know, I'm thinking in terms of like, okay, that this needs to be a, a piece that very much has all the details kind of ironed out in all the different corners so that when it's blown up, uh, that everything looks like it's rendered within the same uh, uh, amount instead of like one spot being like super detailed and the rest being left over a little bit. Um, but yeah, this, this is a case where it was just all, you know, just that's where, that's the process where you can get a little masturbatory with the details. Yeah. So like, okay, now I, and now I get just to get to flesh out all these little things and figure out the different kind of demons that would be marching in this army. There's like a, a bull in his cape. There's like a half mermaid man. There's a bunch of guys with like flags and swords and battle axes. There's even like a Cthulhu monster up in the clouds. So it's all filling out that space in ways that wasn't, I guess the other thing is like, they didn't necessarily ask that it not be, you know, just like a bunch of horned demons with, you know, uh, tails uh, and pitchforks uh, walking forward. But it was something to where like my own decision not to go that way and instead just fill it up with stuff that I thought like looked diverse in terms of yeah. enemy types, I guess you could describe it as. Uh, so when I think of hell, I don't just think of like purely, you know, guys with horns and a, a tail and pitchfork. I think of just all sorts of different fucked up creatures that all happen to be in hell for whatever reason. And he's carrying them along. Um, and then like adding different elements of like, just through figuring out the shapes of the clouds, I thought like, oh, in that top left area, it almost looked like a, like a, some sort of big world serpent uh, wrapping around uh, within the clouds. Like, it'd be cool to just add a little bit of that in there just to imply all the different type of monstrosities that he's bringing with him. Um, yeah, I think the upper left quadrant of this is maybe my favorite. I mean, the whole, the whole thing. Same. But uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of cool stuff going on there, and the and the colors there are so subtle and nice. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's great. It, it reminds me of uh, Paolo Girardi a little bit, how he's able to um, weave in those sort of flowy, smoky things with all sorts of shapes and creatures popping out of them, but always with these really muted, like masterfully considered colors you know he, he's so good at and making things dense but yeah. readable right. too like it's it's and, and so much of it too like if you see like his stuff up close like there there is a certain amount that's like super well rendered but then some of it's just like here's yeah. the implication of of this just yeah. to fill up the space so it it helps your mind fill in those gaps yeah. he can uh, catch your nastiness better than almost any of us pretty much oh, yeah yeah but um, yeah, th this was a case where like it was, it was very much about just putting in the time to get all the detail. So if you zoom in real close, everything's super well rendered and everything, but not to the point of it looking like, I don't know, I, I guess overly digital, the best to describe it. Um, I, no, I just it wanted to... really, It's tasteful, man. It looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, it, I think it, it was also just figuring out like, okay, and off in the distance, add more like uh, 
points that looked like they're like the ch- tops of churches and and like this wasteland that uh, awaits before them is is almost implying like okay well here's uh here's the devil taking on the church again <laughs> and the church just has no chance <laughs> up against this uh, hellish force you know just just playing in, into all the 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 themes of the record that they've shared yeah. with me and and then just very much playing into the, the past slayer type tropes um you did what the, you were supposed to do <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> understood the assignment I, exactly. I guess they would say <laughs> um but yeah my probably favorite part of of painting it was was all the the, the non literal stuff. So I loved painting like the cloud shapes, and I loved painting like the jutting landscape piece coming in the bottom left. Uh, there's something about that that felt very satisfying. Just being able to capture the light. It looks great in there. That lower left, the rocks in the corner there. It's super tight. It looks great. It's uh, it's it, it's always that more abstract stuff like making. It, I guess it's not abstract because it's just like a rocky landscape, but stuff that doesn't feel like, okay, that's a person or that's a, it's you know, that's a hand or anything always feels more satisfying to make look convincing. Yeah. That's, that's like exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about like pulling shapes out of the darkness, you know, it's, yeah. it's always just so fun to me seeing what pops up basically. Yeah. And that's what a lot of these details were because even in the slide before a lot of it was just like okay that's a black shape that i'll fill in that's a gray shape i'll right. fill in especially with the top left and the bottom left where i i know i'm going to put in detail later but to sell it to the client, right. I i need to show the important details but uh yeah no this this one took a little while uh but i'm i'm real proud with how it came out definitely uh definitely one that that will will go on the portfolio and i'll be able to like share with future clients be like hey i did this and and feel pretty pretty it's, happy with it it's hot stuff man and uh one one technical thing i'm noticing too i gotta give you a shout out to your work on the uh like broken chain link that's hanging off of his wrist cuff it's good <laughs> i see <laughs> warm and cool and the highlights there it's uh yeah it, tiny details like that i think you know i don't know most people don't consider them maybe but I but they're it. there like oh, it, it makes such a difference though and i know it's like you don't want to take the time to spend like three hours on like a little chain link but like <laughs> it does make a difference you know it is weird how like little details like that and selling them are are sometimes more satisfying yeah uh because like with me i'm like okay i can draw a skull a million times over uh but okay a hot chain okay what what does that look what, like yeah. what, what does it look like when something like that is hot it, yep. it, what when it's giving off some heat um so with it like came a little bit of blurriness that happens uh when you see something like that hot yeah uh and then making it clear too right uh, yeah. like uh, we're like okay people need to see this because it, it is like a th- thematic thing being unchained and everything yes. um so that's cool it, it's always nice to see what what other artists like notice in, in terms of details oh i'm seeing it <laughs> well awesome man really happy with how that came out and uh do you just keep getting better and better so thanks for I, sharing I, I, that i'm trying you know, it, it, I think the the more stu- these sort of things that you do, the more you're kind of like, okay, I need to, I need to make sure that that like I, I keep convincing people to to work with me, and also like you demand more of yourself. Like I can't just do what I did last time. I gotta I gotta step things up somehow. And and this being being for Carrie King is very much me being like, all right, you yeah. you got the gig, step up. Yeah, that's crazy, man. I <laughs> I keep forgetting that it's. Carrie King and it's yeah it, it's got to be a mental trip to be working for that there, there was major imposter syndrome all throughout the process <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know what I would do with that either. yeah because I, I was just like why is he why is he come to, coming to me why why don't they just get somebody else like am I the right person is my stuff too cartoony no man. um it I I 
like I don't when I think of like something on on like a Slayer cover, I can't imagine my work. But that's just because you haven't done it yet. Yeah, you know? it, it's. I, I off. I also think that I'm just painting cartoons all the time. So yeah, I get, mm -hmm. I get it. <laughs> but no, this is not that. It's great. Well, sweet. This is uh, part one, guys. Um, let's go ahead and take a just like five minute break, and we'll pick up part two. Sound good? Sounds good. All right, sweet.